the most silly thing I find about this, where, you know, it's not even like, you know, Sheikh Imran says schoolboy, right? And this is not even schoolboy. This is like pre-kindergarten. Okay. Okay. No one said anything about, oh, how can we have relationship? They believe in the Trinity. Well, where were the people when they were making all these contracts with America? With the West? You didn't have any problem then. Absolutely. Now a sheikh says, oh, by the way, there's Christians here. We should have contracts with them and we should have a relationship with them. All of a sudden, you remember Trinity? Oh, my gosh. What nonsense. It's the, it's, it's the silliest thing in the world. First. Now, now you know, that you put it, it like that. Hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. It's, yeah. And then those hypocrisy. people that the Quran is saying, tarda an kal wa lan nasara, you didn't remember Trinity then? <laughs> mm. Wow. You know, you didn't remember Trinity all those years. Mm. And now a scholar is saying, oh, those are good Christians. Their men have beards. Their women, they wear hijab when they go to the church. They don't believe in this LGBT. And you now think of they have, they have Trinity, therefore we can't do this. Mm. Have you lost your mind? I mean, seriously, <laughs> this is pre-kinder. This is, this is the level of thinking. It's not even schoolboy thinking. It's mm -hmm. pre-kindergarten level thinking. This it's whole nursery. time, yeah. you've been making contracts with the West. No problem. There's no Trinity issue there. Living amongst them. Yeah, living amongst them. No Trinity issue there. But all of a sudden, there's a problem with Russia. What? That's a joke. Absolutely. You have no <laughs> legs to stand on. Absolutely. You Absolutely. become completely hypocritical. If you have a problem with Muslims building alliances with Russia, Mm. right then you are on the side of those people that Allah says don't make an alliance with mm. bismillah mm. okay so nahmaduhu wa nasalli ala rasulil kareem fa amma ba'd fa'udhu billahi minash shaitan ar rajim assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh to all uh, welcome back to so all of you uh, it's good to have uh, uh, the usual suspects back again alhamdulillah um so today's uh, this is today's, today's the podcast number two. We're hoping to do a weekly podcast every Wednesday. And uh, this was actually one of the most voted topics by the viewers on Telegram to go over this topic of Sheikh Imran Hussain, uh, Alexander Dugin, Russia, uh, the Eurasian world order, uh, these kind of topics. And so hopefully everyone's had a chance to watch the interview that took place last week. So today we're going to get uh, views from uh, primarily, pri primarily Sheikh uh, Umar Balush and uh, from uh, Brother Imran and Brother Sadi. And yeah, if you, if you guys just want to say uh, salams or any comments before we get started. Bismillah. Yeah. yeah, I think uh, this, is, this is something that needs to be done. Um, obviously, in the, you know, the situation with Sheikh and um, the truth has its villain. So we need to take uh, take sides here, kind of, and to portray what uh, what the truth really is. Because I know when when somebody puts something like this online, uh, people get a different perspective of what Sheikh is really about, right? And people sometimes forget that Sheikh isn't an angel, and um, he's a one. Sometimes it seems like he's a one man team, and so we're out here trying to trying to be like he's not alone in this, right? And that uh, we have his back. Inshallah. Yeah, and Sheikh, Sheikh always uh, mentions that uh, he doesn't want parrots, uh, parrots as students, which means that uh, some people will try to defend Sheikh's points by just regurgitating whatever Sheikh has said. That doesn't do any service to Sheikh himself, because Sheikh doesn't want a cult following. He wants thinkers as his students. So after he has taught us something, it's up to us to process that information and think and contemplate and then you know give our viewpoints so uh, inshallah we will not be regurgitating whatever sheikh has taught us verbatim we will be giving you our what what we have understood and our viewpoints inshallah and sheikh will be inshallah. doing that as well inshallah inshallah <clears throat> imam ghazali says <clears throat> once you've internalized someone's ideas in the real sense of the word not parroting as you were saying then it's your ideas at that point okay but uh of course credit should always go 
a true scholar, we believe in asnad, right? Yeah. So if something is from you, it's from you. If it's not from you, then you should give the credit to where it comes from. And uh, I remember like Dr. Asraim, he would be very careful in mentioning all his sources where he, I got this from Iqbal and I got this from Mulan Afrahi. I got this from even, Mo, you know, uh, such and such scholar. He would be very uh, open about where his sources were. But um, what the question is, why does Sheikh Imran Hussein add value to me and you or uh, people that listen to him? <coughs> what is it that uh, he's doing that's adding value for us? Right. So that's like a starting point. Uh, what is he doing? What is he helping? Uh, what is it that he offers? And why is he able to offer this uh, that maybe... Um, other people may not be able, there's not that many people offering what he's offering so what is that so that's one of the things that needs to be investigated uh and you know i can speak a little bit about that but i want to uh first see what others also say inshallah inshallah okay just like this, a... just, just so you know this is important because <clears throat> there was a philosopher who was imprisoned i forget his name right now alexander or something uh, not Alexander Dugan, this, yeah. <laughs> before, uh, this during the French Revolution. Uh, he was a contemporary of Marx uh, at some point, I think there. But, you know, he believed in something called what I am translating in my own words now, my understanding, because this was I studied like 30 years ago, but the organic dai, right? The organic dai um, uh, or the organic scholar. Uh, what, is, what is that, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so I'll talk more about that, but mm. there are certain things that make Sheikh Imran Hussein unique mm. that I think uh, even his detesters will recognize. And one thing I want to add, please, Brother Ways, if you don't mind, I don't want to. Yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> no, 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 no. We, want, every, we like, want everything out today. Yeah, let, a lot of, let's a get lot to it. A lot of let's people uh, have this attitude. They'll listen to him for a few years or a few months or a few years, take a lot of his ideas, agree with his ideas, and then have absolutely no shukr when they disagree. Absolutely. Disagree. absolutely. You absolutely. Know? And it's like you disagreed about this one issue and it's like now he's the worst villain. Whereas you, you have already internalized, agreed, and adopted the viewpoints that he holds in all these other issues. And now, oh, he's no good. Okay, and uh -huh. the problem, okay, I'll tell you what the problem is. I've seen this because I've seen this firsthand. Okay, and I'm going to give you, give you the example of Dr. Israhim Rahmatullahi. He also was one of those people that came out with new ideas. The idea of Khilafah, the idea of how the Islamic State looks like, the idea of going back to the Quran. And he, he had a very strong relationship with Quran. He said many unique things. Well, how many unique things can a person say? Okay. Any new person that's going to come out with unique things, right? Uh, you're going to listen to them for five years, six years, seven years. And then that's, that's, you know, Dr. Sub used to say, I've said what I wanted to say. <laughs> you know, I've said it all. There's nothing more I need. I'm going to add to my own thought. I've, I've built it, right? So there's an X amount a person can build, right? And what happens once some people that are unfaithful and unthankful, what happens is once you have heard everything a person says, you feel like you're at the same level as them. Mm. Or you feel like, oh, you know, this person, does he hasn't contributed anything new, so now you can move on. So what used to happen was that uh, Dr. Asraim, he established a jama'at, Tanzim Islami, right? So somebody mm. joins Tanzim Islami or is listening to Dr. Sab for five, six years, and now he has a good idea of what he's all about. What is his thought? What is his philosophy? He knows his methodology. He knows his philosophy. He knows his topics, the topics he's really good at. He's internalized them. Now he feels like he's in a position. He doesn't need to be in the jama'at anymore, right? I already know everything that this person has to offer, so let me just move on, mm -hmm. right? And so this is one of the things that's happening, and this is a very good filter to see people that have a good heart versus a heart that has other intentions because a person that has good intentions will be faithful to the person that has taught him period 
Mm-hmm. Imam Shafi said that, you know, if somebody like Imam Shafi said about himself that I didn't know how uh, dogs pee, how they pee or, you know, that they how they did it. So he said one man uh, showed me this is how it, you know how they raise their legs and then they pee or whatever it is. Right. I'm just giving an example. So Imam Shafi, Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal said, I used to sleep every night doing dua for my teachers. Right. Because ilm is nur, is light. And so the person that gave you that nur at one time, and now you've become unthankful to him. This is like the most worst thing that a person can do. Mm-hmm. I tell you, knowledge, having knowledge, having knowledge, attaining knowledge is one of the most dangerous things from the perspective of the human heart. You know, it's like wealth. Like mm-hmm. for a person yes. like me, yes. it's like wealth. When you get mm-hmm. a lot of it, you become arrogant. Yep. Mm-hmm. Right. Yes. And once I took all your wealth, or I feel like I took all your wealth, I took all your knowledge. Now I don't need you anymore. <clears throat> Rather than doing dua for them every night, mm-hmm. you know, I know that uh, many, many great scholars, including <clears throat> they used to do dua for their mashaykh very often, very often. Uh, <clears throat> so, you sh- anyone who has learned from Sheikh Imran Hussein. You disagree with him hundred things. You disagree with him everything. But if you've benefited, mm-hmm. right, where he's opened your eyes to something you didn't see before, then you owe him du'as. You owe him du'as because you opened your eyes. Mm-hmm. You were blind before he mm-hmm. came along. So in that sense, uh, whether Sheikh Imran Hussain makes mistakes, doesn't make mistakes, all that, that doesn't matter. The, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has written my rizq through him. Mm-hmm. It's, it's not about even the person it's about what Allah is testing you with right so if Allah gave me knowledge through person X and uh, you know that person X uh, I don't like him anymore but Allah made him the source of my risk right it's like mm-hmm. uh, and so I still have to be thankful regardless mm-hmm. of what differences I have later on and this is also one of the problems uh, that we have is that we we dislike people on the smallest and the most silliest disagreements too, yes. right? And so uh, it's like if we were like the way, if meaning the people before us were the way we are now, Imam Shafi, Imam uh, Imam Shafi, Imam Malik, Imam Wahanib, they would never get along. They would have never gotten along. They wouldn't have learned from each other. They wouldn't have spent years with each other. I mean, Imam Shafi, when he was learning with Imam Muhammad, he didn't know that they disagree. They didn't have cancel culture. <laughs> yeah, they didn't have cancel culture. They you weren't know. splitting hairs. <clears throat> they were definitely not splitting hairs, right? And so I think <clears throat> that, uh, we have a culture that's very ungrateful. <clears throat> and uh, we have a culture that we learn from people and then we just disregard them once we think we have we know what they have to offer and really truly the problem with a lot of the brothers the the, that is this is that they took the information he has to offer the information and did not get the real gem behind that which is the methodology Okay, the methodology still remains hidden for most of 99% of the listeners that exactly what methodology he's adapting to because he has a very specific methodology. Mm-hmm. And so what unfortunately has happened is that again, this is the difference between people that are serious and people that are just looking for knowledge or wealth in their in, in their information to regurgitate right is that people that are serious and want to carry on his work will also focus in addition to the information will focus on what is his methodology okay exactly what is the principles he's using to come to these conclusions mm. right so that you can actually do this when he's passed away mm. okay so the, the the almost none of the none of his people that used to listen to him and then appreciate him, uh, um, that used to listen to him, appreciate him, love him, and then hate him, and hardly any of them understand his methodology, which yeah, is why... And, and, and Sheikh, the proper academic way, if you disagree with Sheikh Imran Hussain, 
and would like to present an opinion, the academic way would be to apply his methodology. And then if you arrive to a different conclusion, then you tell Chef, I used your methodology of study of the Quran, but this is the conclusion that I'm arriving at. Whereas mm -hmm. this was your conclusion. Instead of doing that, people are just, you know, jumping the gun at every, every single thing. Like, like uh, that's a Jewish mindset that if you see a small difference uh, in, in, in the rabbis or the scholars, you go to war, basically. So yeah. first of all, yeah, first of all, yeah, I agree. But first of all, I want to say something you mentioned earlier, Sheikh, is, and me and Sadi spoke about this. This is a common thing, which is uh, throwing the baby out with the bathwater. And that's what you mentioned earlier, that people say just because they disagree with one thing, now they want to say, oh, I'm done with this, all of this, you know, or I'm throwing all of this out. And uh, this seems like it's happening everywhere now. It's like, um, yeah, it's just crazy the way that's happening. Um, so, yeah, for, for that re yeah, sorry, Shay, go on. At a spiritual level, this is exactly what Dijal would want. Like, just throw right. out all his ideas, right? You know, right. Just, right. Uh, anyway, that's that's that. But, yeah, and so um, one thing, like, I think one of the main things with Sheikh Imran is saying is that he comes with that big idea that the West is, you know, the Jalik system. And so when people live in the West, they can't comprehend the fact that the West is, we shouldn't be living here and that we should be mm -hmm. making hijrah. And so they'll look at any excuse to be like, no, no, he's wrong. We, we're okay living here, right? Because nobody mm -hmm. wants to, to, do, to downgrade themselves and to make hijrah yeah. thinking that they're going to live in a cave. When yep. really they, they don't understand that it's the nature. We have to live in nature to live in, in the signs of Allah SWT. That's what Sheikh Imran is saying to me, tells me, right? Mm -hmm. And and I think that's what, what the problem is, that everybody just, they get confused because they don't really understand what the West is really about. They don't really understand what, you know, the way they've messed with everyone's mind, the way they've messed with everybody financially, spiritually, everything. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that those what's one of the big reasons why people don't... Uh, they jump to the other side really quick. Right. And the other thing that happens is that um, people listen to Sheikh Imran Hussain, they like what he says, and then they jump ship, not in the sense of disliking him, but they jump ship in the sense that uh, they start listening to other uh, David Icke or Christian mm. eschatologists. Not that we should not. Mm -hmm. But it's mm -hmm. when your whole vision becomes these people and the Quran itself recedes in the back. Mm -hmm. You see, because uh, there's a lot of things happening, right? I mean, in the world. How will you determine what is important and not important unless you have the Quran? Absolutely. Yeah. Now, everyone wants, to, everyone has to make a YouTube video, right? Mm -hmm. So they have to say something. So the Christians will say something and the other person will say something and they're all coming up with these theories which are all interesting but the problem is that <clears throat> people kind of like uh you know they'll listen to these uh people that are uh, truth truthers or whatever label you want to give them then they'll listen to Sheikh Imran Hussain and they'll be like okay he's a different scholar I mean he actually knows what's going on that's pretty interesting okay let's go back to one of these groups mm -hmm. right and they just get that validation and they don't understand the this is another thing is that they don't understand the basics of islam they don't understand the spirituality of islam they don't understand the 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 principles of islam and and they and these are the people that listen to sheikh Imran Hussain, don't know the basics of the deen and they're they may have gotten confirmation that islam is the truth through sheikh Imran Hussain, but they're not in a position to really sort out what are what are the priorities of what's happening in the world right okay. because now everything every issue that anyone brings up in that channel in that groups is is an issue for them and so it's like i meet so many people and they'll start saying to me uh, just as an example i'm not like making fun of anyone mm. but like somebody said this example that oh you know elon musk uh, he must be dijal because ila means high musk means messiah and so no, I'm, you know, so I'm, and, and, and the brother is like, you know, that sounds pretty, but I'm like, what's that Quran's focusing on? Hey, you know, I'm laughing right now, right? but, it, you know, sometimes the strangest sounding things do turn out true. No, 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 yeah, and, and that might be true, that's the whole point, but the, but the Quranic view of eschatology, 
uh, is very, very, is, is very, you can say the ayat of Quran needs to be the priority, right? Everything else can be in the back. And the problem is when you start talking about all these other issues and not the Quran, you're going to just divide the people because they're like, uh, okay, maybe that's true, maybe not, it's not. But once you have the Quran, once you start with Quran, you have a strong foundation. And what mm -hmm. happens with a lot of people is either before or after, somewhere in the middle, either in the beginning or in the, they listen to Sheikh Imran Hussain, and then Shaitan diverts them to other not so important issues. Mm -hmm. The whole point here is that we look at the subject of eschatology through the Quran. Methodology. First, right? And that we filter the, the ahadis, we filter mm. the social sciences, we mm. filter the world events History. Uh, through, through the Quran. And, and that is what uh, a lot of people get moved, a lot of people are interested in the subject, but then they get moved away from that. Mm. <clears throat> yeah. So while, whilst this is a loose discussion, um, as in like it's based on the reaction, a reaction, a response, an expansion on that interview. Uh, yeah, if any, anyone does have any thought, any moment, just kind of, uh, yeah, let me know uh, anything. You just go ahead, comment. Um, okay, so first of all, um, I've been trying to get yourself, Sheikh, since September as well on this topic. I think you remember when I emailed you uh, that we need to dive into this topic, uh, discuss about uh, Alexander Dugin, uh, Russia, etc. So it seems like now is the time. And so based on that interview, uh, <coughs> I think it might be good to start off with room, uh, the actual definition of room as being the new as being new Rome in the Quran. Do you agree with Sheikh Imran Hussain's interpretation of that? Absolutely. <coughs> uh, I have shown, first of all, when we say the word room, the image the average Muslim gets is of Europe. Mm. Rome is actually a very small part of Europe, like the Roman mm. Empire, because the Quran's mm. not talking about a continent. The Quran's talking about an empire. That empire did not occupy Europe. That, that, that empire occupied Eastern Europe, parts of Eastern Europe and Egypt and Syria and Palestine. Syria, and yeah. Muslim. Palestine. This whole area, this is what they, it was never, and this is why when we look at the ahadith that use the word room, many ahadith that, you know, some people have been saying, well, room in Quran is, you know, those people that stopped Iraq and then now have stopped Syria. But the word in the hadith literature is qibla al-room, in the direction of Rome. Okay, I can you know in the direction of you. You do you remember seeing that, Sadi? Yes. yes. Okay, good. So I got one confirmation, and this is authentic hadith. The Prophet didn't say Rome in that particular narration, but mm. said in the direction of Rome. Mm. So, uh, but it is also possible because sometimes hadith and Quran have a, a symbiotic relationship. There's certain things mentioned in the Quran, and the hadith mentions them differently. Okay, mm -hmm. just as an example, the word uh, ikhlas is used in Quran and not, in, not that much in the sunnah, whereas the mm -hmm. word niya is used in the sunnah of the prophet. So this kind of like one dimension is the purity of it, and one dimension is the, the, the level of determination of it, you can say. One way to put it. You, you'll find this in many subjects. For example, uh, jihad. Jihad in hadith literature generally by and large, means the fighting physically. Whereas in the Quran, it gives a broader view. So you'll find this... Uh, but, but you would agree that uh, priority needs to be placed in the Quran, right, Chef? Of course. We need to... So, so either we take Qibbal al rum to mean in the direction of Rome, or if you say, if you must insist that it's Rome, that it's room, then this must be a different room than the one mentioned in Quran. This is why I was saying that sometimes they mention different aspects, okay, um, of a same word. Of the same thing, yes. Of, of the same word. So it's possible when the prophet said it, he was referring to the continent. Mm. And when the, when the Quran mentions it's talking about an empire, clearly. Mm. It is possible. 
But again, priority has to be given to Quran. And there are a hadith that use the word in the direction of Rome. Sorry, uh, yeah. Um, the recording. Yeah, if you can just give me permission, Imran, so then I can record from my end just in case as well. I'll record from my end. Okay, um, Jazakla Kershik. So um, anyone that is questioning more on this interpretation of Rome as being new Rome in the Quran, Sheikh Imran has got a lecture coming up on the 6th of June in which I'm sure uh, most people's understanding will be more, um, they will understand that, uh, his reasoning more, his logical reasoning more, and they'll be able to ask more questions on that. Um, so on the, on the next connected bit, Sheikh, um, I know that Sheikh Imran avoids identifying Zulpar Nain as a person, but I really loved uh, watching your video on the Believer channel uh, with your uh, clip explaining um, Zulpar Nain using the book of Daniel. And um, me and Sadi, we, we were speaking about this, and he said, is it possible that one is not in conflict with the other? What Sheikh Imran says and what you say is that they can both be reconciled, meaning that I think, from my understanding, Sheikh Imran, he avoids very specifically going outside of the Islamic eschatology, uh, which is uh, understandable. But whereas um, I'm guessing you, obviously you it seems like you stick to Islamic eschatology, but you um, don't do the same as Sheikh Iman does, which is he, from what I remember, he said it in that Moscow interview, um, he specifically avoids speaking on uh, the Christian eschatology. He wants them to speak on it. So it's not that he disagrees necessarily. <laughs> I'm just speaking out loud. I don't know for sure. So uh, Dr. Uh, Sheikh Imran Hussain's methodology is this, okay? He looks at the word Quran in Quran. Yep. And he mm -hmm. says, whenever the word Quran is mentioned in Quran, it never means horn. Okay? And therefore, why should we do anything different with Zulqarnain? Mm -hmm. That is his methodology. And mm -hmm. it is a valid methodology. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it's better from a method, from a perspective of methodology, mm -hmm. it is a better methodology than what I used. Mm -hmm. from it's, a safer, of, it's, it's yeah. safer. Okay. Mm -hmm. Even though mine might so sound more interesting in a sense. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. Because it's like, oh, you know, what a, what a bummer. There's no like, there's no good ending mm -hmm. here. <laughs> you know, uh, there's no, you know, no, no big ending here, but from a perspective of methodology, if somebody says, and over here, I'm just going to give you a hint also, that one of the issues with uh, that, that I know that Sheikh Imran Hussain probably has when he is also looking at the ayah, wa innahu la ilmu sa'a, that he is the sign of the hour or he's the knowledge of the hour, is that he is looking at the word ilm throughout Quran. <laughs> And the word ilm is never used to mean sign itself. Hmm. Okay. And the word, and the, in addition to that, the Quran does use the word alam. For example, in Surah Al-Rahman, uh, um, where Allah says, وَلَهُ الْجَوَارِ الْمُنْشَآتُ فِي الْبَحْرِ كَالْأَعْلَامِ Okay. So he's saying, I prefer the kira that is not ilm because it's not in, consistent in his methodology of how mm. he looks at the Quran. That mm. whenever he looks mm. at the Quran, he's looking at a word and how it's used throughout Quran. He's not going to single mm. out one place to mean something different. Mm. Yes. Okay. Mm. So he is preferring, as Imam Sayyuti does, many of the greatest Islamic scholars have. In fact, I'm going to be coming out a video showing probably at least 10 places where Imam Sayyuti chooses another kira over the, uh, the Hafs kira. Um, mm to give an interpretation that, that he prefers, okay? So because he has a methodology and that methodology is very safe as a methodology, which is that it, looking at the Quran from within Quran. So that was uh, Sheikh Imran's methodology. I, ex I went and what I did was I uh, extended this more into the realm of Hadith and then the Israeliyat. Why? Well, generally in our tradition, we accept Israeliyat. And that should include, by the way, the Bible. The Bible is Israeliyat. Okay, the whole of the Bible is Israeliyat. So 
if we look at it from that perspective and we just say, okay, let's take it uh, from that perspective. When you look at it from that perspective, it seems to make sense. That's the meaning, even though the methodology is riskier, it's less safer, but when you add it all together, meaning the, uh, where the verse of the Bible says, uh, so for example, uh, first of all, we know that Jews asked the prophet three questions. So is Zulqarnain mentioned in the Bible? Well, he's mentioned more than 20 times in the word Zulqarnain, number one. Mm-hmm. Number two, it mentions he will bring together Fadis and Madi. We know that happened by Cyrus the Great. Mm-hmm. We know that Cyrus the Great is considered a non-Jewish Messiah of the Jews. He's the mm-hmm. one that freed them and let them go. So it makes historical sense. It makes meaning... Uh, the Bible and history and then kind of like come together, uh, make it make sense. Okay. Uh, now, can there be more than one interpretation to an ayah? This is the other question. I'm going to give you an example. In Islamic law, in fiqh, we say the ayah, la illa no one touches this Quran except the purified. Did the fuqaha take this ayah and say, okay, you have to have wudu before you touch Quran? Did this ayah have anything to do with doing wudu itself? No. No. We talk about the angels touching the Quran. But from there, they extrapolated and said, look, this means you have to have, you have to be purified before you touch the Quran, physically purified in wudu, in the state of ritual wudu, right? Yep. So, and we know through anyone who has ever studied our tradition knows that one ayah can have multiple meanings. And I'm very happy and very comfortable with that. That's what what I believe as well. And I was telling brother... As long as it is consistent within the Quran itself. Meaning you can't just haphazardly say something. It should have some basis. It should have some legs. It should be consistent with the Arabic language of Quran. It should be consistent with the uh, the 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 message within that part of the Quran that you're dealing with. Yeah. And this yeah, is, this I, is what, yeah, go I, I was telling our brother always that I, I don't I don't necessarily think that the conclusion that you came to about Cyrus contradicts what Sheikh Imran Hussein teaches. In fact, in my mind, I kind of reconcile the two because Sheikh Imran Hussein, uh, from his methodology, he comes to the conclusion that Zulkarnain is referring to two epochs, two ages uh, in which uh, Gog and Magog will be kind of defeated and uh, defeated and exiled by two separate rulers in two ages. So in my mind, I uh, made the conclusion uh, or maybe a conclusion or maybe I was convinced that in the first epoch, it very well could have been Cyrus, Cyrus the Great, who was uh, uh, responsible for defeating Gog and Magog, but the second epoch has not come yet, and in that epoch there will be another righteous ruler who will be uh, similar to Cyrus, who will be non-Jewish, and I, I, in my opinion, it could be Imam al-Mahdi, who will be uh, kind of uh, be assigned the role of checkmating Gog and Magog. That's that's how I reconcile the two viewpoints. Interesting. Okay. Okay. Um, okay so <clears throat> on to the next one. Um, yeah, well, this might be a good time to address the claim that Sheikh Imran Hussein has not come up with anything new. And he, you know, there are some claiming that, you know, as there, there is this momentum gathering, you know, with these haters, messages, uh, all of this, you know, as you're aware of what's going on. Uh, now there are those, as you said, who did benefit from Sheikh Imran Hussein, who has had connections with Sheikh Imran Hussein and now are claiming the um, Sheikh Iman has not come up with any new insights uh, recently that he's just an, I won't say what they've said, but, you know, mm-hmm. he's, he's just repeating himself in his old age uh, from things that he said, I don't know, maybe 10, 20 years back, you know, things like RIBA, the financial, the monetary system, etc. And um, I was thinking, how can they get away with things like this when I myself have only been listening to Sheikh Iman Hussein for the last few years and nearly everything that I learned was new, mostly new, what he came up with in the last few years. But maybe I'm wrong. So maybe if anyone else here, including yourself, Sheikh, <coughs> want to 
help us uh, <coughs> come up with examples of how Sheikh Imran Hussain has or has not come up with anything new recently. <coughs> so there were scholars in Syria that condemned the Freemasons, and there were scholars in, in the Indian subcontinent that also uh, condemned the Freemasons. <coughs> but uh, those endeavors, uh, you know, Iqbal was the first one, maybe other than maybe uh, Mullah uh, Alama Shah Kashmiri, uh, to talk about Zulqan, uh, to Ya'juj and Ma'juj being the Western civilization, and and uh, Iqbal saying that the Ya'juj and Ma'juj have come out. So they did uh, address these in slight uh, variations, some of the scholars, but it wasn't their theme. It wasn't their overall arching theme, right? So they may have uh, pointed the way, but they did not really make it into a branch of knowledge or a science. Um, and so it is interesting because uh, there are certain, what has Sheikh Imran Hussain done? Uh, so let me explain that to you from my perspective. Um, compared to what other scholars would have also done, like the ones in Syria and Indian subcontinent, is that he has taken this as a, I'm saying it in simple words. So he's taken this as a system and identified its different parts and arms. Okay, so riba is one arm, right? Feminism is another arm. Uh, you know, the, uh, the, so all these different tentacles of this one system that's leading the world in one direction, okay? And identifying this as a fitna with all of its uh, tentacles, this was first time uh, done uh, most extensively with, by Sheikh Imran Hussein. And I think the most, one of the most key things here that's still very hard to explain, and I struggle with myself that how am I going to explain this, right? Mm -hmm. Because I think about, I want to do a series on Khilafah, how, what the Khilafah would look like. Mm -hmm. And when I think about, okay, how am I going to explain that we're not going to be too happy about technology, <laughs> right? <laughs> or, or what are the limits of technology? Or, or, or how are we going to like balance this whole issue of technology and the fifth night creates and and I'm like, how am I going to explain this to people? I just don't have words for it, okay? Mm. This is what and, I struggle uh, with. Is it, is it a transition or is it a ripping off a bandage? I mean, a band, <laughs> you know, a plaster or something. It's just yeah, and so anyway, my point being is that he's identified all these tentacles of this problem, with this fitna. Mm. And over here, I want to say what, from an aqidah perspective, Please listen to what I'm saying. From an aqidah perspective, how important is it what Sheikh Imran Hussain is teaching? Mind you, you are not required to know your entire salah and every single proof, <clears throat> single proof that this is the ruku, this is the sujood, this is the qiyam, why is this the qiyam, where is the hadith for this, where is the dalil? Allah is not going to ask you. But for your aqidah, fa'lamu to know your aqidah is compulsory upon in each individual. Mm -hmm. So what Sheikh Imran Hussain is doing is he is actually rectifying our aqidah because the Western civilization, its target is our belief system. Our, our, our target, its target is challenging the belief in the unseen. Mm -hmm. Challenging that we came from you know, that we're just a byproduct of accidents or we're just a byproduct of animals, right? <clears throat> and so a Muslim psychologist, for example, that treats other people basically as animals without a spiritual dimension, he, even though he says he believes in Allah, but he's, he's he, part of his brain has That's separated, shelf. has become completely secular, okay? So what is she, because fitna, right? So that the, the Sometimes in the Hadith books, the early chapters about Iman, Kitab al-Iman, for example, some books of Hadith start like that. And then the last chapters are in Kitab al-Fitan, because Kitab al-Fitan is important for, look, if I'm living in a small village in which everyone believes in Allah and everyone prays, and I'm in the small village, we give our zakat, we work in the fields, 
There's nothing challenging my iman. And so I know the basics and I'm okay. But in a time where your iman is being challenged, you have to identify, okay, look, this is wrong. This is not what it looks like. And this is wrong. And this is not what it looks like. And this is wrong. And this is not what it looks like. So he's not, he is not just saving people. He's saving people at a level of knowledge that is a requirement for them to know. That's what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. It's hard to be a full-time Muslim if you think this banking system is okay, how can that be? It's hard to be a full-time Muslim if you think uh, this immodesty and this technology is all just okay. Mm -hmm. And that these same Muslims are looking forward that tomorrow we'll be even able to do this. And tomorrow we'll be even able to do this. They're looking forward to uh, you know, what technology will be able to accomplish without even realizing the, uh, the, the dangers behind that. And this is this is a sign of a serious defect in our iman. You know, and like I said, you, you're not required to know your fiqh rulings. You are required to know your, your aqidah, your iman, and why you believe in what you believe in. Mm -hmm. And there are things that we believe in that are like almost cause cognitive dissidence, mm -hmm. right? So the, 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 what Sheikh Imran Hussein is doing to an individual psychologically is he's giving us a Islamic worldview that makes sense of the world we live in, in a word, in a world that in which that tawhid is maintained hmm. and the problems are identified. No one has ever done that. Hmm. Okay. No one has ever done that. Meaning yeah. uh, the person who has come closest to this in this field is Dr. Isra Ahmed. Okay. So they kind of complement each other, uh, Sheikh Imran Hussein and Dr. Asra Ahmed, in my opinion. And then I would, if I was to add a third person here, it would be Sayyid Nursi Rahmatullah And if I were to add a fourth person, it would be Malik bin Nabi. But these four basic people, I think, uh, and then Iqbal. Okay, so these yeah, five yes, people. Definitely. So, From, yeah. yeah. So, um, so anyway, this is what Sheikh Imran Hussein has done. He's taken a lot of Muslims that found Islam irrelevant, that found Islam like, okay, you know, I believe, whatever, and then made it real and made it relevant and fixed their aqidah, their iman, right? Uh, in the sense that you, your iman cannot be fixed until you identify the fitness that are spoiling your heart. <clears throat> okay. So, and so so it's because it's more than being a religion... Because Islam, more than being a religion, it's a solution. It's a, it's a solution to the world, right? To, yeah. to the injustice, to all the problems. Yeah. So it, it sounds like you, you summed up how these uh, scholars have uh, represented um, the resistance to the Dajjalic system. Um, whilst maybe you, I, I feel like I could say that the others are kind of teaching people how to um, <laughs> adapt to the Dajjalic system, you know? And, um, but I mean, in terms of actual new insights, because people, uh, they're saying that, you know, Sheikh hasn't come up with anything new. For me personally, I mean, just based on this book alone, the Sheikh wrote last year, yeah? The Messiah, the Quran, and Akhirul Zaman. It's the only book I've bought of Sheikh so far. I'm not a long time student of Sheikh's, but it's the one that I thought I need to have because um, I was blown away when he went through the five proofs in the Quran of why Isa alayhi salam is returning, you know, without going into even the Hadith. I'm, I was blown away then when I heard it in Pakistan, uh, and I'm still blown away by it now. And I honestly believe because it's so new, people still haven't quite picked up on it. They haven't studied how his reasoning, his methodology is. And I think it's actually the most important one. Actually, today's lecture in Edinburgh is on that topic. And, um, <laughs> and for me, it's like... Um, whilst there's this movement out there of people saying that oh you know these three main actors are not coming onto the world stage you know the jal is not coming the isa alayhi salam is not returning uh imam mahdi is not coming you know this is this is their this is like the ultimate response that sheikh iman hussein has come up with by using the quran um to prove and as he always says if i am wrong then tell me what is right you know, but nobody, and, uh, nobody ever and, seems. Sorry, just one moment. No, mm -hmm. Nobody ever seems to study it, 
and they all want very quick responses. What you see on these camera recordings, they want something that will take 20, at least 20 minutes, maybe 30 minutes to understand. They want a quick 60 second response from Sheikh on you know, these questions. And whereas he's got books written here and you have to actually spend the time and understand. So it's on that. I wanted examples if anyone else, you know, Sadi, if you can, Imran, if you can, what is it that you've benefited Sheikh from Sheikh Imran recently? I'll just give you one more example. For example, the Quran, <coughs> the Quran and the moon. I if correct me if I'm wrong, that's a relatively new insight that he's had. So people say he's not come up with anything new. Am I missing anything else? I think the Quran and the moon in some ways is one of his biggest insights. Mm. Okay. Yeah. And more than that, to get students to read the whole of Quran every month um, based upon the moon, I think that's just uh, such a big... And mind you, in one way, he's not new. Sheikh uh, Imam Nitaimi had his own, his own also 30 or 29 juz. Ajza. He had his own way of reading the Quran. So it's not the first time that someone is kind of like deviating from the normal 30 groups that we have. Okay. Uh, it has been done before many, because this is not part of the original Quran. No, it's no. Not, part it's not part of the original. So it, how are you going to finish the Quran in 29 days? Well, mm -hmm. That's, uh, you know, that, that a, a person is allowed to make ijtihad in that. There's no mm. issue with that. Mm. Um, but yeah, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. The Quran and the stars, that's his biggest mm. uh, finding. And also, in, the, in only the last five years, he has taught us that uh, when, you, uh, when you break your fast or you pray, uh, fudge, it's, you have to look at the sky. To, uh, to mm. distinguish the time, not the clock. I mean, people yeah. pray uh, people pray by the clock. Uh, the, the last two Ramadans were the first ones where I didn't even look at the clock, uh, what the time is. I, I, I looked at the sky. Mm. And he has a kind of, uh, this is one step further in connecting back to nature mm. and uh, using nature to, to bring your spirit in sync with nature. So uh, if, if you can link the nature to your prayer, I mean, this is a very good, good process, in my opinion. And he uh, and in the last five years, he has, I mean, now uh, uh, there are many, many Orthodox Christians watching his videos and even watching our channel. And uh, this building of uh, a, a political alliance as well as a social alliance with the Orthodox Christians, he has only done this in the last two years. So, I mean... That, that is like that is not just theoretical or like giving lectures that is ground based work that is field work that he has done uh, so i mean that is a big big step in my opinion that he has big, big. how, how yeah. about you brother imran um, <coughs> so i've mentioned uh, the return of isa alayhi salam in the quran i've mentioned uh, the quran and the moon <coughs> um, brother sadis mentioned about the connection to nature uh, you, you know, Sheikh has mentioned uh, the broad uh, vision that Sheikh Imran has given us. What is it that you would say to those, Imran, um, that say the Sheikh hasn't come up with anything new, anything beneficial new recently? I'll just give you one more example. The Jasad in the Quran. Yeah, I, if I'm, correct me if I'm wrong. And Sheikh, Sheikh I recently. want to share some insight yeah. I had from that okay, okay. single verse about the Jal I gave to, okay. but later, later. Yeah, later, yeah. Later. Go, yeah. Go ahead, brother. Imran. So there's, I mean, I don't know how much time we have, but, you know, if we were to see, okay, let's just put Sheikh Imran Hussain first to a side, which Sheikh, besides Sheikh Omar, which Sheikh has said anything new, regardless of what they've said? I don't mm -hmm. think any of the people who say that, okay, what has Sheikh said new? That's a good point. Their, their scholars haven't really said anything new, so I don't understand. So, but even put that to a side, what Sheikh Omar or Sheikh Imran Hussain has done for us, I mean, I wouldn't have known Sheikh Omar Baluch if it wasn't for Sheikh Imran Hussain. I wouldn't have known Brother OS or Brother Salvi because of Sheikh Imran Hussain. So we wouldn't even have this whole channel because of Sheikh Imran Hussain. If he didn't inspire <laughs> from a personal level, um, one of his lectures where he kept drilling, like, why don't you think about the Quran for yourself? Why don't you think about the Quran for yourself? And it, I remember, still remember that one point where it was like, wow, you know, I need to do this on myself, for myself. Like, I need to look at these ayahs for myself and I need to ponder upon it really deeply because um, coming from a Deobandi type of scholarship, 
where they tell you that no you can't you're not you it's a, the one person actually told me uh, Molana told me that it's actually a sin that if I was to write my insight of an ayah that it's actually sinful to do that right so I mean what does what does that say like we've been put into a box and they don't want to let anybody out but um just on you know what he says says about the island of the gel like sure he's he's talked about uh, the monetary system he's talked about you know other things but even like atheism you know the grandfather of atheism charles darwin he came from that island as well mm. right mm. even the uh what you would call it brother always is island yeah i was trying even, to hide my <laughs> Even the government system, the language that they use, English, which came from that island that which dominates the whole world, it's it, yes, that's exactly. the real magic. That's the I mean, real uh, magic. Sheikh Imran Hussein opened the floodgates exactly, for us. Exactly, that's what I was about to say. Uh, and then Brother Imran, me and Brother Avis, we discuss a lot of things in private. If not for Sheikh Imran Hussein's inspiration, Mm. We would not have, we would not even have bothered. We would be like, oh, let's just be like the Salafis, arguing, fighting, killing each other. Let's, how let's to make... keep out the names in this one. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> or, or how to make wudu. But Sheikh Imran Hussain uh, like taught, the main thing he has taught us is not to look at the trees, to focus on the forest, mm. to like be, be big picture, think mm. of the big picture. And that is actually a very key thing that uh, mm. the Western society has done they have made us reductionist thinkers hmm. exactly. you know and uh and 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 you know the quran is universal and then comes to something specific and we always are looking at the leaves or the tree rather than the forest and this is a very big problem this is why we keep running into all these other problems which like for example the age of aisha or the allah on her issue because we get stuck on the leaf <laughs> rather than look at the bigger picture. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, so just one more, this one more thing I want to just... I will mention to... my first introduction to Sheikh Imran, which was, I don't know, 30 years now, mm-hmm. was a lecture he gave about wudu okay. and not to waste water. Yeah. And that not to use more water than you can have on your uh, one mud, basically. Mm-hmm. And he told all the members of Tanzim Islami uh, at that time and that uh, don't be like, I'm not saying this in a derogatory way, uh, all my love is for them, but kind of like, you know, like some people will go, I won't mention it then, uh, you know, they open all the faucets and they do, will do like, you know, because yeah, Juj and Ma'juj will drink up all the water and water <laughs> is a very um, sacred element. And uh, so be careful how you do what you will do. So that, I started being careful in how I do my wudu after that, right? Even how much water I was using for a shower, you know, because of that. And I'm sure at that time, when this is in the 1990s, I'm sure many, many other people also adapted, uh, you know, his teachings um, at that time. And so, and I follow that till today, uh, the, the whole trying not to waste water even though I'm not good at it at all, but mm-hmm. uh, but I try. Um, but yeah, yeah, I started everyone, doing. Everyone, everyone, a lot take, everyone takes a bath every time, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I mean, you know, we've all benefited tremendously, and uh, and, and it's sad when people have, especially. I don't mind people that haven't benefited, and they just think he's bad. And that's fine. Mm-hmm. The problem for me is uh, the, it's, it's disappointing to see the hearts of the people that have benefited and then they still want to bash him. Mm. Yeah. On that, yes, yeah, so I forgot to mention earlier, uh, you were describing that situation. And the thing that comes to my mind is from my experience uh, about five years ago, I used to analyze when I used to go to like uh, these dinner parties, Dawats, you know, Dawats, if you like. And um, I used to listen to people criticizing someone else saying um, about riba, you know, getting another house on mortgage, etc. And they would criticize the people who are saying that this is haram. And they would say it's okay to get an, another house or whatever on mortgage. And then those same people would be like, you know, the sisters that are wearing hijab, <sighs> they would kind of criticize them saying, you know, because they don't wear a hijab. And I actually brought up one time saying, 
don't you think it's better if you just say, hey, you know what? I'm not that great a Muslim. I, en- you know, I kind of envy you. Uh, you're right. You know, it's very clear that Allah says that you shouldn't, you know, get a- another house on mortgage. You should avoid riba. I pr- pray for me that I am like you. I, you know, I get closer to you. Same thing with the hijab. Instead of trying to find reasoning why, uh, you know, they are wrong or you are right. Just accept that, you know, they are better in the sense, they are more practicing in that sense, you know, wearing the hijab. So it's the same thing. It's almost uh, like when it comes to Sheikh Imran Hussain, if you can't make hijra now, then it's almost like these same people are like, yeah, Sheikh Imran Hussain is rub- you know, he's all wrong about everything. We can just live a good life, you know, or whatever, whatever basically suits whatever it is that <coughs> you kind of want to do or you are already doing. You know, that's what it seems like to me. I think I think he he makes he makes us think, he makes people think about the internal conflict, right? Mm-hmm. And either you accept the truth that yeah, we are living in a state where you know that <clears throat> all of our desires are manifested, and you know we have it so easy in the West. Why would we go and live in nature, which is something people think that is so hard to do, right? Mm-hmm. So that internal conflict of okay, what, you know, what, what should I do? Should I do what's right? Or should I just continue on with doing with what I know? And justify that. And, t- and justify yeah. that, that's right, yeah. And justify mm-hmm. that themselves. If I can add two more points, if I remember yeah, them, please, inshallah, yeah. that Imam Ghazali has a rule that, you know, if there's a village that doesn't have a doctor, you should not live in that village. Mm-hmm. If there is a village that doesn't have an Islamic scholar, where who you can ask about your divorce or transactions or you know basic stuff if you don't have a basic scholar even in your village you should not live in that village mm. now uh about the doctor that you should not be in a village with the do- that has nothing to do on the from the zahir of the deen meaning from the apparent of the deen doesn't have anything to do with that but he was realizing okay wait this is such a good, important need that every village, every society needs doctors. So therefore, <clears throat> it is fardul kafaya for having a, a doctor in every village. <clears throat> and why would you want to live in a village that doesn't have a doctor? It, it just was for a person at that time, it's the fifth century. Like, that's silly. Why would you live <clears throat> in a village with no doctor? So <clears throat> there are certain, to have, no one in your scholarship, I'm not pointing to anyone. I'm from Dar al-Ulum mm-hmm. myself. So I'm talking mm-hmm. about Azhar or any of the other, you know, and then the problem is with these academias, right? Like Islam, Islamic University of Islamabad, Islamic University of Malaysia, they all want to be so academic, right? And they just want to regurgitate women's rights, women rights, gender issues without talking about these issues. Uh, and what I mean is that, is it a need, if it is a need, right, of our time to have somebody in every city that's able to say and understands the subject of the fitans? Mm. Okay. Is it a need or not? So I let's ask this question. Is there a need that somebody should be there, that there needs to be scholars in every city who specialize in understanding the Dijali system? Okay, how do we, how do we understand this? I will offer an answer to that. And that is that the most important hadith out of all <coughs> hadith literature, the most important hadith mm. is the hadith of Jibra'il. Mm. Okay. It is considered amongst the muhaddisin one of the two most important books, uh, hadith, right? And mm. when it, the Prophet is talking about Islam, he's giving the very basic fundamentals of Islam, very mm. basic and fundamentals of Iman, the very basic and fundamentals of Ihsan. Then he tells us the signs of the day of judgment. Mm. Very basic. Mm. Meaning when you start seeing tall buildings mm. and when you start seeing surrogate mothers or the UN f- freeing people from slavery, that is a sign now you need to specialize in this. Mm. Now your Iman mm. is not safe. Meaning just as the basic fundamental definition of what is Islam, the rest of Islam is more than that. The basic definition of Iman, the rest of Iman is more than that. The basic fundamental definition of what is Ihsan, Ihsan is much more than that. 
Sure. The same way when you see this sign, you, just as people specialize in Islam and Iman <clears throat> and Ihsan, you need now people in every city identify, being able to identify and understand the fitans. You have to do that. This is part of the deen, right? That once you see tall buildings, that's now we need to start, you know, now it's time. And maybe things have happened that we didn't even realize that things have happened and we're thinking it will happen. See, that's where we are now. Things have already happened that people think will happen. Like, yeah, Juj and Ma'juj coming out. They're still waiting for everything. They're still waiting when the tall building's already there. Mm -hmm. So it's, it, it's at a very, very fundamental. So the first point I was saying is that it's, things are no longer like a simple village. There is a very complicated set of events and institutions and uh, things are progressing with such level of fitna that it is mandatory that there has to be people that are studying this. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's absolutely mandatory. Number two, that when is it mandatory? And then I'm offering this hadith of Jibra'il. When you see the tall buildings, that's the time that this is becoming meant. It's just as many <clears throat> as Iman and Islam. <clears throat> you identify, okay, now that I've seen these signs, what is the Prophet saying? That this is the very foundation on which the rest of it will be built, <clears throat> right? Meaning of each one of these four categories. This is the very found. When you see this, <clears throat> you need to start specializing. Now what is happening is, we're specializing on Islam, we're specializing on Iman, we're specializing on Ihsan, and we're not specializing on the Fitans, even though we see tall buildings. This is, it doesn't seem right. Mm -hmm. Something is missing. And so we need a scholarship because now the deen won't, your view of the deen won't be complete unless you have, before you could have gotten away with three, three you can say stories. Your understanding of the Sharia. Before the Prophet's law. death. Or, yeah, no, no the before prophets. the tall buildings, if you yes. only focused on Islam and Iman and Ihsan, you were good. Mm -hmm. But after the tall buildings, you mm -hmm. have to now study the fitans. You have to. I like the because, way you well, even, even before the tall buildings, there was uh, there were signs of the it, of something like this coming by from the industrial revolution right so once and it I, happened yeah, yeah. once it happened there's there's so the the issue here is we are still studying the past books yes but we need to add this department within the framework of deen mm -hmm. because that's what he came to teach and remember this had this this event took place about six months <clears throat> before the pa prophet passed away <clears throat> This happened at like an okay. This is now my, I'm, you know, I'm going to pass away. This is your deen. And telling the people of the future, when you see these signs, then be careful of this. This is very important. So extremely important. Yes. I think it is mandatory that in every city, in every village, in every madrasa, in every Islamic department, there has to be people who are studying the fitans. Yes. Which is yes. Number one from Quran. Number two from the hadith, and then number three from the social sciences and whatever else is available. Yeah. Sheikh, uh, one, one thing, uh, I think it ties into what you said beautifully. So uh, a lot of people who uh, are rejecting hadith completely and uh, it, it's, I mean, it's good to prioritize the Quran, the Quran and the Quran over the hadith. But uh, as Brother always said, to throw the baby out with the bathwater, the hadith, completely disregard the hadith is, uh, dangerous uh, stance in my opinion so i'm just going to ask you this question because uh, as brother always said in sheikh imran hussein's book there are five quranic proofs of uh, isa alayhi salam returning so okay that's already in concrete that isa alayhi salam's return is supported by the quran and then uh, dajjal is mentioned in the quran uh, uh, not by name but as a jasad and that single verse actually has a lot of details. I was thinking about it and I told Brother Ruiz, I'll tell you later, inshallah. So the Dajjal is also uh, mentioned in the Quran. But we, uh, from our uh, Islamic eschatological studies, we see that the Dajjal, Isa salam, and Imam al-Mahdi have a triangular relationship, like interdependent. Uh, the, the, the events and all the fitan are interlinked. But then people will say uh, Imam al-Mahdi is not mentioned in the Quran and has no basis, 
has no Quranic basis. Then by that argument, the whole triangle kind of collapses. The whole eschatological I would, I would argue the other way. The whole, whole eschatological argue. narrative collapses. So what is your response to this? That Imam al-Mahdi has no roots or basis in the Quran. The Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, or the Quran rather says, that huwa alladhi arsala rasulahu bil huda wa deen al-haq liyudhirahu ala al-deen kulli. That Allah sent his mission <coughs> with the Quran and deen al-haq to make it dominant over all other al -diyan. Okay, all other systems of life. So this happened in the lifetime of the Prophet amongst the Arabs. Okay, mm -hmm. but is yet to happen globally, where Islam is the dominant deen. Now, whether you identify Mahdi or don't identify Mahdi, from the Quranic perspective, that is secondary. The main, the first point, because the people that argue there's no Mahdi coming, the root, root cause of that is they don't see Islam flourishing. Mm. You have to realize this. Okay. The root cause that uh, some of the people or all the people that say, oh, you know, the ahadis of Mahdi are, uh, they don't look real or so on and so forth. The root cause is why? Because two, two root causes. Number one, either they they feel that we're so dependent on the idea of Mahdi and we've romanticized it so much that it's holding us back, which is in itself has merit. But the other side is the more dominant side, which is they'll deny the coming of the Mahdi because they don't see Islam working in the real world as a system, as a Khilafah. They don't see the rise of Muslims. So, you know, how can there be a Mahdi when I don't see even Islam rising? Okay, the people that accept the idea of the Mahdi from the Hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu they it is easy for them because they first accept this premises that the truth will win. When you accept the premises, the truth will win. Mm. Okay, now what? <clears throat> now we know in the tradition of the Arabs, okay, Allah sent His Messenger to dominate the whole deen, the whole world, the deen. Okay, so now the tradition of the Arabs is that. If you're not there, meaning the prophet, then there must be somebody from his family to witness that. Mm, mm, this is the Arab mm. tradition. Mm. If you may remember, uh, when uh, one of the uh, Sahabas, they said when they were conquering Mecca, he said, today is Yawmul uh, uh, Malhama. Today is the day of Malhama. We're going to butcher everybody going into Mecca. And the prophet took the flag from him, but in order not to dishonor him, gave it to his son. <clears throat> right? So th this idea of Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Ali Muhammad, uh, it's salutations on Prophet Muhammad and his family. His family. And this has to do, the salah, salam is different. So we have salams to the Prophet and salah on the Prophet. Salah has to do with the help and the work and the mission of the Prophet. Okay. So Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Ali Muhammad. The way Ibrahim and his progeny were helped in their deen, meaning with Da'ud and Sulaiman, that may Allah also give the same to the Prophet mm. Okay, So uh, this is one aspect. There are other aspects too. But I was just clarifying the root cause of it is that they don't see Islam on the rise. They see the West and how far it is with its nuclear weapons and the technology and the internet. We can't even make a needle in our countries. So they assume these nation states will exist forever. They assume mm -hmm. that technology will continue to progress and they don't see Islam on the, in the view of <clears throat> rising at all. From the external eye, they don't see it. From the in external, the external eye. eye, that's right. right. Yeah. So, so my, my reasoning is what Brother Sadi said earlier, uh, when he's describing this relationship triangular, this threefold relationship of Imam Mahdi, Isa alayhi salam, and um, the job antichrist yes the antichrist right. so my my thing is the opposite actually, which is okay they say it doesn't exist in the quran but then sheikh Imran hussein comes up with again people need to go through this we can't use this session to go through it we do have a clip that abu bilal does a brilliant half an hour expl explanation 
uh, going step by step how Sheikh Iman arrives to the conclusion of the jasad being the jawab. So when Sheikh Iman does that, then it's like, okay, the Quran does show that Dajjal uh, exists. And then maybe people can argue saying that, okay, uh, that's not too clear cut, you know, it's uh, someone's interpretation. Although if you go through the logical reasoning, it's, it's um, as Sheikh Ramana Hussain always does, he makes his work unbreakable. And mm -hmm. other than that, he won't comment on it. Even if he has a thought or an idea, he won't comment on it unless it's unbreakable. Mm -hmm. So that's the job. Then the second one is what he, how he proves using five proofs that Isa alayhi salam will return in the Quran. So then my thing is, okay, fine. If you haven't got anything about the Mahdi, mm -hmm. if, yeah, if you haven't got anything about the Mahdi, then for me, it's enough that you've just proved one of those exists in the Quran. So for me, it's enough that I have faith now that just because we can't see it right oh, now. Oh, later. Yeah. Just because we Wait, can't I'm see it. Just because we can't see it. Yeah, if you need to speak, just uh, mute yourself in charge. Mm. Um, yeah, so just because we can't see it, it doesn't mean it, it doesn't exist. Maybe, who knows, in a year's time, two years' time, three years' time, someone might even prove, hey, look, I've just found in the Quran the Mahdi is returning. These things have just come recently. The Jasad being uh, identified as Dajjal, uh, Isa al Islam returning, the five priests, that's very recent. So for me, it's enough to know that just as one is proven, then yeah, that means it's giving enough strength to the other two just because we haven't found it. That's that's how it is for me. The Mahdi is directly or indirectly somewhere in the Quran for sure. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, like indirectly, you can say the ayah of the Quran that says, uh, don't, don't enter into Mecca except very scarefully. And uh, the worst of the people are those people that try to destroy the house of Allah. So this is one of the events that looks very close to what will be happening in the time of the Mahdi when the army will be coming to destroy the Kaaba. And, uh, and uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala specifically mentions uh, in Surah Al-Baqarah that uh, don't, you know, don't go near my house. Otherwise, uh, there might be consequences for such people. Well, Surah Al-Fil is there, but there's this ayah in Surah Al-Baqarah that specifically talks about that. And that, that's, I'm not saying that is that, but if we think about it deeper, I'm sure we will find something in the Quran directly or indirectly related to this. So on to, <clears throat> this seems perfectly timed because I was going to ask a question. Does there appear to be this new age like Islam forming that does away with all hadith and produces a new way of interpreting the Quran that removes eschatology completely? Have I said and, that? Uh, right? Yeah. Maybe I will ask, give you a specific, specific example. Try, try uh, not Sheikh, to mention any names. Try not to mention any names. I will not. Uh, go, uh, I will not uh, give my opinion because yeah. uh, Sheikh is much. But uh, there is a channel within uh, in, on YouTube with a lot of subscribers, yeah. and I I, I I still reserve my opinion on him. But I think Dr. Sheikh uh, Omar Balash knows uh, marvelous Quran. Uh, that type of uh, scholarship. What do you think about this? Yeah, because I didn't look into this, but I did. I did touch on uh, some of your work, Sheikh, uh, when you were responding. But I did when I first looked at it. I immediately felt in my heart that there's something suspicious about this. And um, now it seems like there's another momentum gathering. It seems um, where yeah. Sorry, Sheikh, if you just want to expand on that, because it does feel quite dangerous. Because uh, just one one thing, Sheikh, I don't know if you're aware of this brother. Mashallah is a very beautiful brother. His brother called Anwar Sheikh on YouTube. He, Mashallah, brother always, and I've been watching him. And I hold him in equal regard to Sheikh Imran Hussein and you. And he has told me that he has studied Sheikh Imran Hussein's work. But he is so important, his channel, because he places a lot of importance on the Quran first and then only the Hadith. And I've asked him also today, I said, uh, what is your opinion on Dr. Hani from Marvelous Quran? And he told me, unfortunately, I'm not convinced of the epistemic rigor of his methodology. The inferences which Dr. Hani arrives at are often stretched beyond reason. So yeah, that's what he told me. Now, What's the name of this person, this brother? Anwar Sheikh, I will I'll send you a, a link. Yeah. Of it, it, it was actually posted in the talk group, the video. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> I, I, as far as um, 
my question is is there a movement is there some kind of movement it, it, gathering it, where this right? ends up is basically i'll tell you where it ends up yeah. it ends up in uh what is in philosophy called um uh, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. I'm forgetting the word, but all Abrahamic religions, they're all the same. This is where it ends up. It first starts with this. It first starts with had, remove hadith. <laughs> Phase two is we are following the way of Ibrahim. Okay. Which all and, sounds, yeah. and, and it is it is this type of movement that uh, they want to create. Um, that uh, you know all three and this is why the general will be able to fool all three groups very easily because humanity will come because the whole thing is we're compromising 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 especially in our islamic law but now we've compromised our islamic law to the point now you know first it was at the political level then economic level now they've gotten into our homes right they've social engineered our society now they're going to go into the human being and start working on his aqidah on his iman okay and so now the first step is a uh, question mark on hadith question mark even on the quran question mark on the character of the prophet okay and mm -hmm. creating a, an environment where everything is okay especially in the liberal sense of the word right hope if you're okay with homosexuals which is where muslims are really going at a very fast pace Okay, you become okay with homosexuals. Well, then you should be okay with Christians and Jews. <laughs> you know, that's just the other side of it, right? The, the, the left side is homosexuals. The right side is, or you could say the, the, the other side is the other religions. And so then you see, oh, good Christians are doing this and good Jews are also very fine with them. And then why shouldn't we? Mm -hmm. And this is the problem. Remember, when Isa والسلام, came down, who were his biggest opponents? It was the ulama of Bani Israel. Mm. Right? And so, the, who will be the biggest opponents of Isa when he comes back now? Majority of them will be the, it will be the masses listening to the ulama. Mm. It'll be the masses listening to the ulama because the ulama would have compromised themselves to mm. the point. Mm. Right? Because of the reductionist thinking, maybe because, because of the uh, you reductionist know, as Sheikh Imran Hussein says, Isa because they salam. will deny hadith to the point that when finally the event happens mm -hmm. and it they hear about it, they'll be like, Oh, we already know those, those are weak hadith. What are you talking mm -hmm. about? Right? What are, you, what are you talking about? We already know those are weak, we don't even accept hadith. Mm -hmm. So things are very fast moving in the new generation of denial of hadith. They make the prophet like a postman. He came with the Quran. He gave you the Quran. His work is done. Mm -hmm. No love for the prophet, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. No like following his sunnah. Mm -hmm. No like identifying with the prophet at an emotional level. Mm -hmm. for, not at the intellectual level. Not at the emotional level. He has no role other than he handed this book. That now there are no rules on how to interpret it. You can interpret it however you want. You can make. Uh, Anything that you don't like, and Mr. Uh, this brother's problem is also what he gives an interpretation. Anything he finds women, uh, like for example, the hoods of Jannah, for example, he always oh, like, oh, what's this? Well, you know, this uh, the hoods in Jannah. What's that? That's like silly. This is not talking about hood. Is something else, mm. right? So, like anything the West d dislikes, he's basically changing those parts of the Quran, and people are so silly. That they will deny 1,400. See, there's one thing is you're adding something to the tradition. It wasn't there. And you're adding something like Quran and science. Okay, add something. It doesn't deny the past. Uh, Sheikh Imran Hussein comes with things that are adding to the past, adding new dimensions yes, to the past. Yes, new ways of right. thinking. Also. New yes. ways of thinking. But what he is doing, and which is <clears throat> extremely dangerous, is completely denial of everything in the past. It doesn't even matter. It's Protestant Islam at its best, which is we don't need any authority over us how to interpret. Okay. We don't need the whole, throw the 1,400 years in the garbage. They've all failed. There was no Imam Ghazali. Salahuddin was no great person. Imam Nithamiya wasn't great. Shawlullah wasn't great. Throw it all in the garbage. And now I will interpret the Quran for you to fit the modern paradigm. This is what is basically being done. Mm -hmm. And part of that is disconnecting the book of Allah from the prophet. 
And I find this very interesting because Tulkahaf starts and mentions the Prophet even before the Quran. Alhamdulillah, Ladi Anzala Ala Abdihi on his slave. And Abdihi is a special term because the greatest thing you can be is the Abd of Allah. Right? So that's the greatest thing. In fact, some scholars argue is his title Rasul higher or his mm -hmm. title being Abdihi or Abduhu higher? So Abduhu is mentioned first. And so some scholars, especially uh, in, in mystics, they argue, you know, his being the servant of Allah is higher rank than his being a Rasul even. Meaning that he's the perfect uh, example of being an abd of Allah in that sense. Anyway, so as an abd, you're facing Allah. As a rasul, you're facing human beings. Right? So uh, the point I'm trying to make here is that there's definitely, definitely a movement. And it's probably paid and funded and all of that to divorce the Prophet from mm. the Quran. Mm. And what does Quran say about that? Those, those that want to make a dis distinction or separate the Quran and the Prophet from one another, they're the ones that are the liars, the Quran says. Mm. Yeah. See, see, my feeling is, Sheikh, that we live in times where two people... So, uh, brother, oh, wait, it's just so I don't forget my thought. The yeah, other sure, extreme sure. is that we accept every hadith that comes up yes, yes, without any yes, critical yes. thought. Yes, Sheikh, as Sheikh and Imran was, that yeah. side uses this side to justify itself. Extremes. And the people of Quran that will use the Quran to filter everything, they're left in the wilderness. <laughs> mm. Bo yeah, both, well. Sheikh, both Sheikh Imran Hussein and this brother Anwar Sheikh actually give the most balanced view regarding hadith. It's that Always try to exhaust the Quran first, and truth is the Quran can never be exhausted. It always uncovers the more you mm -hmm. seek. Mm -hmm. But accept hadith when hadith are in corroboration with the Quran. And if a hadith contradicts the Quran, of course, you disregard it. But if a hadith is standing by itself, there is no uh, kind of support from the Quran, and also there is no conflict with the Quran, you, you uh, kind of remain with it unless you see that that hadith, maybe you see uh, whatever that hadith is describing, you see that in your uh, timeline kind of unfolding. Then you start giving that hadith some weight. So I think this is a fairly balanced approach yeah. to the hadith. I, lo I, lo I like the way you say disregard it. You, you never hide behind words. You say <laughs> yeah. it as it is. Whereas Sheikh yeah. Imran... See, what I found is he's very, <coughs> very careful. He says he sticks with the Quran instead of even saying that he disregards the Hadith. See, that's that's something that people will shock people. When you say you disregard the Hadith, you know, they, that, they will hear those words and they will understand it differently. But if you hear mm -hmm. someone say that, no, because of this contradiction, I'm sticking with the Quran, then it doesn't sound as, uh, as though as if mm -hmm. you're rejecting the whole of the Hadith. And... Um, and he's yes. not rejecting the whole of it. No, he's not. Yeah. He just has a filtration process. Yes. Well, on, well, on that, so when I did look at, yeah, on that, when I did look at a lot of David uh, Livingstone's works, uh, I don't mind mentioning him because he's excellent. Yeah, a lot of people will recognize that some of the things that I mentioned in the interview were basically based on his works. And he's done excellent investigation and excellent work mm -hmm. on his books. But this is what I mean. Is it that you know, people can look at the same thing, two pe people can look at the same thing, but they can see two different things. So with him, he can look at this evidence and he can, he can come to one conclusion. Whereas when I look at his evidence and I see that he's make, he's, he's um, using the, he's saying that, you know, Mahdi is not even in the, uh, it's in weak hadith. You know, that's what David Livingston says. For me, mm -hmm. that tells me that this might compromise his general view on things on how he sees the same thing that we see, but we see it differently because he's of the view that, you know, uh, these things that are from quote unquote weak hadith don't necessarily exist. So that's what it seems like this movement, there's a lot of these people 
that seem to give a lot of support to some of these things, which makes them people think, oh, we have to re-question everything now. We have to re-question uh, all the hadith, you know, because, yeah, the Mahdi does not exist apparently because it's a weak hadith. And um, so, yeah, so I was just wondering, are all of these people like playing a part in this, whether they know it or not, they are giving support. That's how it seems to me. Feeling the fire. Feeling the fire, yeah. Unholy fire. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a very dangerous path that is yeah. being created. Okay, very, so Sheikh, very dangerous. Yeah. Okay, so Sheikh, um, the first question that I did ask, the first major question I asked Sheikh Imran in that interview was, can you recall how Allah has used a valim, an oppressor in the past, to bring about his will on earth? <coughs> uh, although Sheikh gave a good um, example, or the best example he could think of at the time, me personally, I was hoping that he might touch on Genghis Gen Khan. Genghis Khan, the biggest Genghis one. Khan. Yes. So I'll ask you the same question. <coughs> and maybe I should have held that back and seen what you come up with. Can you recall how Allah has used the and a person in the past to bring about... First of all, the Quran makes one thing clear, that the first reason Allah uses non-Muslims is to punish the Muslims. Okay. If you read Sutul Isra, this is clear. Other ayat are clear. So giving the example of the former Muslim Ummah, Bani Israel, the first punishment came to them from the <laughs> north, the Assyrians. Nebuchadnezzar, King Nebuchadnezzar. And so I, I'm coming to, to that. And the first punishment to the Muslim Ummah also came from the north, the Crusades. Mm. Okay. Then the second punishment of Bani Israel came from Nebuchadnezzar in where they were taken as captives to Babylon. Okay. Why? Because the Ummah wasn't doing what it was supposed to. Because the first rise happened under Daud and Suleiman. Then they started bickering amongst one another. Then the Assyrians yeah. attacked. Then they had a second rise. Then again, they came to the same point. Then in that, uh, so the same thing, we had uh, attacks from the east, uh, from the north, and then we also had, were attacked from the east, Genghis Khan. Then after that, you have the Ottoman Empire in the Muslim world. Over there, you have the Maccabi power amongst the Jews. Okay, that also begins to fall, followed by in Bani Israel by Western imperialism. The Roman Empire takes over. We also begin to fall Western imperialism. Okay, do you see the? So the first way Allah uses non-Muslims to correct or help the ummah mm -hmm. is by punishing us. Okay? <clears throat> and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this in many places, include, including Surah Al-Rum. We will punish you with small punishments before the big punishments so that you will return back to us. So number one. Number two, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also uses non-Muslims to help the Muslims. There are many examples of this. Look at Abu Talib, for example, was the uncle of the Prophet As long as he was alive, he was able to protect the Prophet and the whole of Quraysh couldn't do anything, any, any, any big steps against the prophet personally not his companions against the prophet personally they couldn't take any steps against the prophet and he continued his mission under the what the protection of his uncle then number two when the prophet وسلم, went to taif and when he was returning back he had no halif halif was a system of protection he was told you have no halif you have no protection now you cannot even enter Mecca again. The Prophet had to send one of his uh, companions to go to Mecca. And under the protection of a non-Muslim, the Prophet entered back into Mecca. Okay, under the protection of a non-Muslim. he. So this Allah has been doing with the greatest Prophet. Allah allowed the Prophet protection under a non-Muslim, under a greatest, protect, a greatest Prophet of Allah. Not once, but twice. Okay, then uh, the Prophet وسلم, made alliances after that when he was in Medina with the non-Muslims. And the alliances are very good because if they, if they don't mean well, then they'll break the alliance and it'll become clear they don't mean well. 
And if they mean well, then they're going to keep the alliance. And you'll know after a few years, well, these people keep the alliance. Mm. The Prophet himself is quoted to have said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that the Christians never broke my alliance and never opposed me. Okay, this is what he said. Why, did, why do you make alliances? For protection, mm. right? The Prophet made alliance even with Quraysh in Hudaybiyah, right? Ten years of peace, the original contract. Ten years of peace. So they are going to help Muslims regardless. Why? Because if they break the alliance, it becomes clear who's our enemies. Mm -hmm. If they keep the alliance, then we have a friendship relationship with them. I'll, I'll give you another example. Look, your parents are mushrik. They're idol worshippers. You become Muslim. What are you going to do? Say you're not my parents anymore, you're mushrik? You'll keep alive. That same parent is now helping you in your education. You've become Muslim. That same parent is helping you in your different tasks in normal life. What are you going to say? I'm not going to take your help because you're a mushrik. You get married to a virtuous Christian woman who believes in the Bible, goes to the church, has a priest, right? She's uh, not uh, this uh, secular Christian girl. She's a real Christian girl. You get married to her. Does Islam allow that or not? She becomes your protector or not? Islam she becomes your helper in life or not? Yeah. Okay. So then if it's true at this level, then Islam has no inconsistencies, right? It's true at the individual level. I can marry a good Christian girl. I can keep my relationships with, in a good relationship with my mushrik parents. They may hate Islam. Even but they're helping me in their heart. They don't say too much because I'm a good son. They don't oppose me too much because I'm a good son, even if they oppose me, but I still am good to them because I'm keeping yeah. my contract. Mm -hmm. Right? So the point is that things have to be consistent. You can't say, Oh, well, you can marry a Christian girl and you can keep your relationship with your parents, but we're not going to have any good relate. And then the, the most, Silly thing I find about this where, you know, it's not even like, you know, Sheikh Imran says schoolboy, right? And this is not even schoolboy. This is like pre-kindergarten. Okay. Okay. No one said anything about, oh, how can we have relationship? They believe in the Trinity. Well, where were the people when they were making all these contracts with America? With the West? You didn't have any problem then. Absolutely. Now a Sheikh says, oh. By the way, there's Christians here. We should have contracts with them and we should have a relationship with them. All of a sudden, you remember Trinity? Oh my gosh. What nonsense. It's the, it's, it's the silliest thing in the world. First, now, now you know, that you put it, it like that, true hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. It, yeah. And then those hypocrisy. people that the Quran is saying, <laughs> you didn't remember Trinity then? <laughs> mm. Wow. You know, you didn't remember Trinity all those years. Mm -hmm. And now a scholar is saying, oh, those are good Christians. Their men have beards. Their women, they wear hijab when they go to the church. They don't believe in this LGBT. And you now think of they have, they have Trinity, therefore we can't do this. Mm -hmm. Have you lost your mind? I mean, seriously, this is pre-kinder. This is, this is the level of thinking. It's not even schoolboy thinking. It's pre-kindergarten level thinking. This whole time. Yeah. You've been making contracts with the West. No problem. There's no Trinity issue there. Living amongst them. Yeah, living amongst them. No Trinity issue there. But all of a sudden, there's a problem with Russia. What? That's a joke. Absolutely. You have no legs to stand on. Absolutely. You Absolutely. become completely hypocritical. If you have a problem with Muslims building alliances with Russia, mm. right? Then you are on the side of those people that Allah says don't make an alliance with. Mm. See, this, 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 this is what it is. The same comparison can be made in your daily life. Are you going to continue to say, yeah, exactly. oh, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't um, be business partners with this person. I can't teach this person. I can't learn from this person. I can't be friends with this person because they've got this. If you have this mindset again and again, you know, it's like you'll be, get nowhere. And it, it just seems to support more of the whole cancel culture. Oh, they support Trinity cancel, you know, 
And uh, wasn't uh, the Prophet, uh, I don't recall the event correct uh, properly, but Sheikh can perhaps perhaps confirm. Wasn't the Sheikh's, uh, wasn't the Prophet's uh, prophethood kind of affirmed by the cousin of Khadija, who was yeah, a Christian? Again. Yeah. And <clears throat> that was a family that was slowly becoming Christian. Hmm. Khadija's uncle tried to do a coup in Mecca, just so you know. <clears throat> Very few people know about this. Her uncle tried to do a coup in Mecca in the days the Prophet was thinking of Hijrah. Hmm. Like to take over. Okay. When the Prophet was put in his, uh, his uh, boycott for three years, where they weren't allowing buying and selling in marriage or anything, who was helping the Prophet at that time? It was his non-Muslim relatives, hmm. who are the same people who later on accepted Islam. I mean, uh, I can just go on on this. No, no, no. Yeah. yeah. It's just unfortunate that we are living in a time where we can be exposed to so much information that it's like in that, in, in that time, in that time, they wouldn't see, oh, this person has been caught doing this. They're worshiping Satan like this, or they're still uh, doing this in their religion. So when you build up all of those, it's like, you know, oh, we can't trust anyone, you know, but whereas, yeah, like, like how you said, if they want to build alliances and there are things that are common to both of us that we agree upon, you know, that are more important than those differences, then yeah, we should definitely be making alliances with them, even if, so this, this is the other part of the question, even if that leader appears to be some kind of dictator, I mean, like, um, this is what, this is what people say, that the Russian leader is a dictator, the Chinese leader is a dictator, and I can't agree or disagree. I don't know how you guys feel about this. You know, it's like for me, my, my response usually is, look, that might be the case. It's not that we're supposed to support these leaders, but the way that they have control, somewhat control <coughs> over their people, when it comes to Allah reviving the religion on earth, are you more likely going to see it in the land where everyone has been free to do whatever they want? Or is it going to be in the land where people have been controlled somewhat? Even if, the, even mm -hmm. if, even if you can call that some kind of oppression. For me, that's like the outward oppression. But for me, over here in the Western world, that's like an internal oppression. Outwardly, you're free to do whatever you want. But in the, inwardly, we're oppressed because of that, you know. Whereas over there, they're controlled uh, somewhat, it seems. Again, this is just my thinking. I don't know what... Well, you, again, you know. that would be very subjective. If mm. there is a collective view mm. that we are a collective, if there is a collective view that spells we and us, mm. then what a, a individualistic society would look at, these people are controlled. Mm. They, may, they, may not, they may feel that, oh, if this happened to us, this is really bad. Mm. You know, they put those hijabs on all the women. Oh mm. my God, you know, mm -hmm. that's like the worst thing that can happen to women. But what mm. if you're in a nation, all the women agree to that, mm. right? So it seems... So it's the idea of control is also subjective at the collective level, meaning what, uh, what a group of people, uh, if in general, let's say there's a critical mass that agrees upon something. If there's a critical mass that agrees upon something, then they don't really feel it as like, oh, this is our big oppression, right? This is, this is not how they see it. Um, so it, again, a person that's living in an individualistic society will not be able to understand the subjectivity of a people that are living in a, in a collective with a collective mindset. Mm. Okay. And so they're not going to be in a position to judge. Mm. Right. This is my fear that we are brainwashed <clears throat> in that, in that yeah. sense, in that sense. Yeah. Mm. So, but, you know, coming back to the question of dictators and so on and so forth, uh, it's it's pretty pretty simple, okay. Uh, let's say um, they've done all the worst things. Is is our our alliance supposed to be based upon what they've done or what they can do for us? Mm. Exactly. Yeah, that makes it. That's a really great point. I think you yes. know what Russia is doing in Russia. Okay, mm. but if Pakistan makes an alliance with Russia, we're only looking at that aspect of the the alliance that's between, let's say, Pakistan and Russia. It strengthens right? both sides. It strengthens both sides militarily, economically, so on and so forth. So why aren't you going to do that? So this is the question. 
the, the, so, he, so if China is oppressive or if Russia is oppressive, so America is not oppressive. This is the same. Again, this is another preschool problem, mm-hmm. right? You want to point out whatever Putin has done is not 1% of everything the West has done. Yeah. Not Absolutely. 1%. Absolutely. You know, it's, the argument is, is, a, is a trash can argument. It's hypocritical. And it du- has double stand. You're doing exactly what the West wants you to do. Or even the uh, UK. Let's I ignore mean, everything yeah. we've done. Right. And look, let's look at all the bad this person has done or this country has done mm-hmm. without looking at anything. And let's pretend we never did. We, let's pretend we never killed the Native Americans with smallpox mm-hmm. by giving them blankets. Let's pretend we never said there's me- weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. Let's pr- pretend and let's pretend and let's pretend. Right. And this is another problem that people have. They try to judge the real versus the ideal, meaning Ooh. our ideal, okay, our ide- Amer- ideally America is so beautiful, but look at them. They're so bad. They're doing this and this. We do this with Muslims ourselves, like the self-hate. Look, America is so good, but look at us. We have bribery. We have this. And we're, we're, we're comparing ideals to practically what's on the situation on the ground, mm-hmm. right? instead of con- comparing practical to practical, okay? Yes, mm-hmm. there's domestic violence every second. There's somebody raped in America. I mean, mm-hmm. let, let's, you know, if you want to do practical, then do practical to practical. And if you want to do ideal, then let's see which one is ideally more consistent with itself, mm-hmm. right? But what we do is, and what people argue is, they want to argue uh, either just looking one lens without mm-hmm. anything else to compare it with, which is, and, and they've compromised themselves completely on the other side and they're not willing to look at that. Or then they'll compare the ideal versus the practical mm-hmm. instead of ideal to ideal and practical to practical. Yeah, so I should. Yeah, sorry, go, on, yeah. go, on, go, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. No, no, I just wanted to insert Brother Imran, he had to disappear because his uh, uh, little one, uh, Ibrahim, he's, I think, what is he, six months or nine months now? Uh, yeah, he just woke up. So just in case anyone is wondering. Um, yeah, did you have any further thoughts, Brother Sadiq? Yeah, I'm just saying the luxury deludes you. I mean, the Western lifestyle, it's so easy, it's so beautiful. I mean, you get your salary in crypto. So it's That's quite convenient. So the, lux- <laughs> the luxury is deluding people, mm. like really ruining your perception. Yeah. So that's, that's just what I'm... Okay, so uh, one of the other questions that I raised to Sheikh Imran uh, was, as Muslims, should we be totally against any form of liberalism and individualism? What do you think, Sheikh? Should we be against any form of liberalism and individualism? (coughs) This was the first challenge for me. There's some questions that human beings can't answer. For Mm -hmm. example, uh, the balance between the capitalist versus the labor worker. Where do you draw the line? And if you are on one end or the other, you'll be biased. Mm -hmm. You cannot draw a line and balance between male and female rights. Can't do it. Okay. The society, the collective and the individual, the private and the public, we also can't do it. It's impossible for any human being to come up with an answer to these three questions. Therefore, you need a third point of view that is not human or oh, Allah. Right. I like that. To di- divide the public from the private and where these lines actually exist. Mm. Okay. No human, human beings can't come up with an answer to this. Now, there is two things. Uh, there is liberalism and then individualism, not as a philosophy, but mm. individual rights as a legal right mm-hmm. and then the public as a public right sure. liberalism as a philosophy mm. and individualism as a philosophy is completely haram mm. and antithetical to islam thank you okay because because dugan says and this is where i this is where he really caught me in his book as well as we are familiar with um 2030 agenda right we're familiar with the un's goals and we're familiar with the language they use as well. So they dis- they they was it they they disguise themselves with their aims and intentions through language which appears to be attractive, right? So what is it? Sustainability. That sounds good, right? 
yeah. you know i'm sure you can come up with other examples so that's speak double speak right so speak. What, what do they do once you once you've caught them then they change the that label that you've now caught on to to a new label you know but it's really the same thing just like what is it socialism is communism yeah and uh, so what dugan says is the individualism is the last word of liberalism so that i did not realize that that individual individualism is just a new term for liberalism and it makes sense completely to me Mm. yeah that's what it because is because if you're free to do anything mm. you basically you're an individual do, do anything that pleases your nafs your uh, so you you become a worshiper of your own self you worship your own desires your own ego mm. etc mm. so yes yeah. so is this shaitan's ultimate strategy to atomize us shaykh Omar? yes yep because the prophet said when there's two the third leaves the shaitan leaves right right and uh, shaitan doesn't want a jama mm. and he wants to individualize us to the point that we're friendlier and have better relationships with our ai robots mm. uh, than with other human beings mm. and uh, we become very easy targets for shaitan alone unless you're creating a jama or a society within a society and having a plan for hijrah you cannot you cannot survive the onslaught i'm not even talking about hijra itself i'm talking about unless you don't have brothers around you right that are doing awrad or adhkar and you're praying together and you're doing ta'lim together unless you don't have that jama you can you will fall short somewhere the wolf will devour you yeah because shaitan knows your weakness mm. right and and so the, you have to be in a jama'ah. Yadullahi fawq al-jama'ah. I command you of five things. Allahu amarani bihinna. Allah command. You know the five pillars of Islam? is jumla khabariya. Islam is this, 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 this. Right? But this is a command by the Prophet from Allah. A'murukum bihamsin. I command you of five things. Allahu amarani bihinna. Allah commanded me to those things. Bil jama'ah. Wa sama'ah. And to listen and obey and to do hijra and to do jihad in the cause of Allah. So you, five. Five. Okay. You know, exactly. so yeah. uh, anyway, so you, there, there, there is no concept of Islam, even in Fatiha, Ihdina, yes. Allah guide us. Us, us, and we, yes. Us, you know? yeah. Yeah. Okay, and so just quickly moving back to um, what Dugan mentions in his book, did it surprise you when I listed these? Because it surprised me. I don't know if it surprised you. So definitely, yes. definitely. Uh, when he listed the, his and his philosophies: anti-modern medicine, anti-vaccines, anti-technology, anti uh, against DNA altering, and uh, very much pro-hydra, making exodus from the big industrial cities, returning to real life on the earth, practicing agriculture. In fact. In the India talk, I don't know if anyone heard this, but I mentioned an ec extract from his book where he goes, he speaks further in detail. Honestly, it's beautiful what he writes. This is, this is, the, this is the strange thing about Dugin. I want to make clear, we've not all of a sudden become Dugin fans and like blindly following and listening to anything that he says and does. You know, we're just pointing out something that seems to have been hidden. Um, Why is this? Yeah, it's something that seems to be not in people's uh, eyes or ears. And we're trying to figure this out. <coughs> so what do you think, Sheikh, when you hear that someone like Dugin or coming from Russia, um, that he's anti-modern medicine, anti-vaccines, anti-technology, you know, these things. What do you think, Sheikh? The, when you gave that list of anti-this, anti-this, yeah. other than anti-vaccine uh, vaccine, and other than, you know, kind of like being uh, against modern medicine, other than those two, mm -hmm. he sounded just like Iqbal. Right. So, on. Yeah. Yeah. so I was surprised, mm -hmm. uh, very surprised. And I think that uh, we need people that, you know, that study his thought uh, mm -hmm. properly. And, and then again, filter it through the Quran mm -hmm. and uh, take the gems that are left from it. Yeah. Because I mean, even if it turns out that this man cannot be I don't even want to say this because it's almost like as if you're going to be shooting yourself in the foot from any alliances or any good work that you do. 
But even if it turns out that this man has other agendas or he doesn't agree with some things and he believes in something strange, you know, just based on these things that we agree upon, isn't that what people are looking for right now? Isn't that what you're looking for, you know, in this hopeless time? You know, I, I remember following one person who knows clearly that you can't trust Trump. Yeah, but I'll just mention his name, Brendan O'Connell. He knows that you can't trust Trump, but he's like, at this point, what are you going to do? You need him. Things are so bad, yeah, that you need Trump, even though you know what you know, but you have to kind of use this right, righteous, positive momentum that he's right bringing. Wave. Yeah, to bring about something good, you know, rather than just sitting back and just saying no to everything. I don't know. It, it just sounds like to <clears> me <throat> that it, it brings people to action, brings people to hope, inspires people that, you know, we have some kind of glimmer of hope. There's some light. You know, that's, that's, that's what I see anyway, yeah. So, yeah, okay. Um, and, okay, and the next one. Um, so as Muslims, should we be part of Dugin's fourth political theory and be part of their great awakening simply because they are against the World, Economics, World Economic Forum's great reset? For me, you know what that translates to? What? Khorasan Plus. Mm. Can you expand? So you have all the Khorasan there, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan. Mm -hmm. uh, you have this whole Muslim countries that are poor and need alliances okay, mm -hmm. on the one side. And you have these Christian countries that are true, truer Christians. Armenia, so it's an alliance sure. of Khorasan with Christians. And then you have China and India. Okay, so... If these, first of all, if, if, if this ec economics is one of the things that can help Muslim countries get closer to each other, okay? So if Afghanistan, for example, builds alliances with Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, remember, uh, I say this sometimes that, you know, the first trip that uh, Zulkarnain made was to the Black Sea area, which is where the problem one problem. Azerbaijan, Armenia. Okay. And then the second one he made to the place where you don't find any shelter under the sun. So this is the Khorasan area, okay? right. the desert. Okay. And then you have the Christian people there, and you have the Muslims in there, and you have a very good economic block. Okay. It's a very natural at every level, ideologically, geographically, okay. Politically, it's a very good block that can become a very anti-liberal block. So ideologically, economically, spiritually, religiously, it becomes a very good block, right? So I, there's no like, oh, well, I'm doing business from you because I really need you. But in the long term, I'm going to put my, have to put my, my knife on your back because we don't agree ideologically, right? So this, yeah. is, this will not happen in this case because they can stay Christians, Mm -hmm. and we can stay Muslims, mm -hmm. but it's also a way of doing da'wah, yeah. you know. Yeah. It, it's a way of doing a major form of da'wah, and I don't want to go into that side right now, but completely just from an alliance perspective, it's a very mm -hmm. natural alliance. Mm -hmm. The people of Khorasan, and then you have the uh, Christians who say we are Christians, that's their identity, not Judeo-Christian, Yeah. right? And then you have, then this block can deal with China and India accordingly. Okay. So, uh, and this is also very natural from other perspectives that the whole human population is now on this side. Okay. So, uh, and there are a lot of other aspects to this, but this is like my view from Stunkahaf is pointing me uh, in the direction that, uh, that uh, this area where there's desert uh, could all become one block. Mm -hmm. When you add all the other verses related. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I will continue moving on, uh, Brother Sadi, just in case you have anything to add. No, no, no. Go on, go on. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, the next one was about where... So wait, can you help us Muslims get a better understanding of the grand chessboard or the great game that these warring factions, the elites of the East and the West are playing? Actually, sorry, I didn't plan this properly. Uh, ignore that one. Um, 
Okay, so Dugan also says that Satanists such as Crowley, LeVay, and Lovecraft are not the real concern as they do not hide and are open about what they do and believe. Rather, it is modern science and modern culture that is the real black magic as modern civilization is a preparation for the Dajjal, the Antichrist. So I'm repeating what I mentioned in the interview. These were Dugan's words. The, uh, the real black magic is uh, modern science and modern culture as modern civilization is preparing for the Dajjal. Uh, can you provide us any reminders from any of the eschatological studies <coughs> that support um, this statement of Dugin's? Is there some kind of Qur'an or Hadith which completely matches this statement of his about modern science, modern culture being black magic and modern civilization being a preparation for the job? He's saying that uh, people who proclaim that they're Satanists are not are just like kind of circus-like. Mm. But like the real evil is, as, as the quote says, the devil is in the details. Mm. The real evil is kind of hidden and presented to you as something technologically advanced. But mm. that, that is the real evil. That is where all the stuff is happening. So, um, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. So magic is one of the arms of shaitan, one of the tentacles, right? Mm. So he has many other tentacles. But the definition of magic is to change something from its reality. So in that sense, the, the bigger sense, it's about, uh, you know, science is type of a magic in a sense of uh, it's able to uh, do great things uh, that seem magical or would have seemed magical before. And so you have this friendship of magic and science coming together for Dijal, where he will be able to do all these miracles. So the system is the, you can say the, the, because the magic, magic is there, but the system is, uh, you can say perpetual magic, almost at a bigger level. It's brainwashing, right? It's indoctrination, <clears throat> where it makes easier for shaitan now to attack you, right? So like you have your, your, you know, your entertainment culture, you have all these distractions that shaitan can enter you by, right? And then magic is one element of that. Yeah. Um, the, the, the interesting thing is that, look, the Quran says Hizbu shaitan, the party of shaitan, right? And uh, not everyone's a saint, saintness. They're in key positions. And then, so, you know, they have some impact. But what makes it easier for these Satanists to perpetuate their agenda is the system. Meaning, if mm -hmm. you were a Satanist and you were under the Islamic system, you would still be a Satanist, but you can't do anything. Mm -hmm. You know, how are you going to convince people that, okay, we should have gay and gay lesbian marriages? You know, mm -hmm. you couldn't do that. The system is the, is the so, you know, at, at the, at the uh, yeah, so secularism, liberalism, and then the other layers of this whole thing uh, is, is the problem. Mm. And, uh, yeah. <clears throat> that's, uh, that's also one of the, there's a symbolic reason for why, you know, these NFL games, the Super Bowl, in the halftime, there's always a ritual. You look at it and it seems like they're saying something amongst each other, but you don't really understand. Mm. Like the NFL, the Olympics, all, all of these major events, they, they kind of, do this uh, ritual in halftime or before the ceremonies as if to show okay this is the stage where we are uh, in our grand plan mm. you know mm. so they're they're telling you that you know you're in that system of evil the, their grand temple of worship yep yeah. grand temple yeah um yeah so just in case anyone doesn't know i mean we've We've mentioned in the past, and I think Anthony Patch has taught the best in terms of how technology is black magic. You know, the roots of it, geomancy, the geomantic arts, the, was it, dot, he, he connects it back all the way to Isa alayhi salam's time. It's something I hope we can go through in the future, but he, go, he, did, he connects it back to Isa alayhi salam's time when he found, uh, apparently, Allah knows best, when he found um, those who were drawing dots in the sand as their form of magic at that time. Mm -hmm. And he says the technology is just the advanced version of that. These creating the dots and trying to, what is it, predict and analyze. And um, yeah, so the whole prediction, anyway, so this technology 
<clears throat> is ultimately a tool of shaitans and it's a dajjalic tool right but okay so yeah and plus they have certain objectives so they want technology for example to go into disguise that they were prevented after the quran came down right mm -hmm. so they want to you know ya ma'ashar al-jinni wal insin istata'tum so they want to be able to go back to the sky mm -hmm. and this is kind of their victory uh and also uh having control over uh the jinns so and then the jinns want to use the humans and the humans want to use the jinns for certain objectives uh and part of this from the jinn perspective is to get back to where they were before the Quranic revelation, so that they will have that same power to listen and be with the angels and so on and so forth. Right. <clears throat> okay. So, um, yeah, so I think we've covered that. Yeah, on the note of Eastern Orthodox Russia, um, so Sheikh Imran Hussein holds the view that the people of Russia are slowly returning to their Orthodox Christian roots. Do you agree with this, Sheikh? They absolutely are at a very fast pace. At a very, very, very fast pace. And this is just mm -hmm. the beginning. Because mm -hmm. I will tell you that with the influence of Alexander Dugan, mm -hmm. okay, and how he has taken Christianity and given it a philosophical shape that is unique, anti-Western, and puts Russia at a philosophical point where its elite can relate to that philosophy and they can also take steps at the business level, at the corporate level against the liberal West, right? And so the last thing, I mean, one of the things I want to share with you is the last thing Shaitan wants is to show a world where there's white people who believe in something religious. This is like the Christian Khilafa, okay? If you show them a Christian Khilafa, well, then the Muslims are going to want their Khilafah too. And so you have the political leader, you have the religious leader, like the king and the, uh, the pope kind of like scenario coming back. And the West doesn't want the people to see that as a positive thing ever. By West, I mean the satanic forces. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And uh, if, uh, if they emerge as a better, more just society and more uh you can say mature society uh and and shames the west uh then that that puts the whole liberal agenda at a very uh difficult spot because mm -hmm. there, there's you know in the muslim world which country can oppose them right so there's this one big real powerful uh center left that can oppose liberalism and the new world order and so on and so forth um and you know and so th this is this is the reality of it is that uh russia seems to be going back to its christian roots and uh those christian roots are challenging liberalism because why the very basic forget about aqidah for a second okay but at the level of sharia we have a similar sharia right honor thy parents not put them in you know these homes that don't care for the parents uh, don't do magic, right? Mm -hmm. uh, all these things are are part of this Sharia, the the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments, yes. The Ten Commandments versus liberalism. You can write a whole book on it. Mm -hmm. You can write a whole book on the Ten Commandments and how it, the economic justice it talks about, the mm -hmm. honoring of the elders and the parents, the mm -hmm. um, taking care of the orphans, and so on, and being godly, right? And willing, wishing uh, the will of God. So. Um, at the level of Sharia, we we have many common elements within the Sharia that put us and them against uh, the liberal uh, West. Now, unfortunately, Muslim mind is more colonized mm. than the Russian mind yes. or the Christian mind. The Christian yes. mind is not as colonized. Yes, as we've the been Muslim more attacked. Mind. We've been specifically attacked for yes. a long time. So this is why maybe Allah is using them hmm. to, uh, uh, in one of the byproducts of that is Muslims will be helped. Yeah. And not just that. I mean, there is the connection between how the world was against Muslims during that false flag event in 2001. And now 20 years later, uh, they are against the Russians in the new false flag event, you know, uh, event. 
So there, are, is, there is that connection that we both kind of feel the same as well. We were the ones under attack and hated by Western society, and now they are the ones also. And it's always been their, their game plan anyway to attack these two, the Muslims and the Russians. Yeah. Um, okay, yeah. So um, was there any final thoughts uh, that you had about the Trinity? I know you mentioned it earlier. It was very... Um, it was a very good response. We're going to use that clip, inshallah. But was there anything else that you maybe wanted to mention about the Trinity or any last words? <clears throat> you know, Orthodox Christianity has many variations too. It's not monolithic. Hmm. So, for example, the Christian brother I interviewed, yes. uh, he was very adamant about that we don't believe in Trinity as hmm. the West believes in the Trinity. Okay. And so he was trying to make a distinction and trying to say to me that we, we are monotheistic. Um, so there are different, you can say, versions of Trinity. But what is important to know here mm -hmm. is the gospel as it is today already existed at the time of the prophet. Mm -hmm. Christianity as it is today already existed at the time of the prophet. Mm -hmm. So it's not like we can say, well, at the time the prophet was different and now it's different. That's not the case. So whatever the relationship the prophet had with the Christians, mm. that was based upon the books that they still have today. It's the same. Mm. Okay. They had the four gospels back then. They have the four gospels now. Right. So those, uh, those books that they read as part of the Old Testament they had back then, those are, in fact, the Quran even says, uh, The Jews say the Christians have no claim. And the Christians say the Jews have no claim. Even though they're reading the same book, just like today. The Old Testament is the same on both sides. You're reading the same book, yet you differ with one another. And you say the other has absolutely nothing. Mm. Right? So, um, anyway, so I think that uh, we're not asking, the, the part of the problem is because you don't see the forest, you're not asking the right questions. Right. And the question should be, what does Islam and the Sharia allow us in terms of relationships? Yep. What does the Sharia allow us in terms of international relationships? Mm. Where does uh, Sharia allow us to have relationships? And where does Sharia not allow us to have relationships? Mm. You know, as you're saying this, I've just drawn a connection. Am I right in saying that the scientific mindset, the literal mindset, and the Salafi mindset are very much the same? Yes. Yeah, they're all the same. Yeah. You're just looking for things very, um, you know, without the internal eye, without the... You're looking for evidence, and your evidence is not universal. Your evidence is reductionist. Yeah, reductionist, yeah. Okay. Right, so you're looking for evidence, and it sounds very appealing. Oh, evidence. Okay, well, that's good. Mm -hmm. Let's go with the evidence. But it says evidence this. Evidence itself it is this. Yeah. 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 And then, you know, we look, we don't, when we look at a topic, we don't look at the topic above it. Hmm. Meaning, uh, let me give you an example, okay? So the Quran says, Qulu lin nasi husna, Say good things to human beings. Mm. Now, someone is being oppressed and you say, look, Quran says, be good to human beings. Mm. Okay? Quran says, but does Quran give any exceptions to that? So this is the, you know, where, uh, la jahra, uh, la jahra illa man dhulim. There's no saying something wrong unless the person's been wrong. So it's like we get stuck on one thing and we don't see what's on top of it. We don't see what's on the bottom of it, yeah. right? And uh, we just get stuck on this. So, so this is what's happening right now is we become Context very... Context and bigger picture, yeah. Seeing, yeah. Not seeing the forest. And okay. this is why we're trying to solve our, all our problems through fiqh. Right. Yeah. Rather than to... Because fiqh will always compromise to the situation. Hmm. Fiqh will say if there's all pigs around you, go hmm. ahead, eat the pig. Hmm. Right? Hmm. And, well, I guess we can't do anything. We're just going to eat the pig. And let's and keep eating it, the pig. And then it stops. They're never going to think like, okay, how can we ever get out of this situation? Right, right. Because right. their whole emphasis will be on how can we run with the system? How can we mm. move with the system rather than change the system? Mm. Yeah. And Isa Islam was about changing the system. Mm. Throw, throw away everything. Throw mm. away the den of thieves. Throw it all. Change the system. Building the kingdom of God. Building the kingdom of God. Yeah. And so, you know, you've compromised now to the point where, wallahi, I mean, I don't have time to go into this, but our wudu water is suspect. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. Because you're supposed, you know, you, you're supposed, it's supposed to be the color of the original water where it came from. Mm -hmm. It's supposed to be smelling like water, not yeah. something else. It's supposed to be tasting like water, nothing like else, right? Mm -hmm. So you, your whole, everything is compromised. You're not allowed to pray on a land that's stolen. Mm -hmm. The whole of America is stolen. <laughs> I mean, you can just, but it's, it's, we've compromised and compromised and compromised and compromised to the point that Islam is no longer Islam. It's just some rituals and some questions and some debated uh, hot topics. And there's mm. no like true essence, uh, light. True, no. There's, there's, there's no true nur. I mean, there's no mm. true search for God and truth and living a godly life and connected with nature. And none of these questions are being asked. Fik Fik can even make the mRNA vaccine halal as it as it has. <laughs> no, and even if it was, you still can't do that. Just you know, kind of like the way they did it. Okay, look, the way it has to be. Again, this is why the local moon sighting concept is very important because they try to do everything globally. If I live in a masjid and there is no issue in my masjid and there is no issue in the ten masjids near my masjid, why should we obey any of these laws? First of all, first, second of all, if there is an emergency, you're going to eat pork. Okay, then you're going to eat pork only for a limited time, not perpetually, right? So this, uh, th the whole thing is messed up because you never make something that's supposed to be temporary permanent, mm -hmm. okay? Emergency means temporary. Like there's, there's a durura, I have to eat a pig. You're not going to eat it forever. You have to have, okay, we're going to eat it. That also means I'm going to try to get out of that situation where I'm not eating the pig. That no one talks about. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Absolutely. Okay, so in, the, in that sense, um, removing these figures. See, this is where the problem is. People are quick to chop down figures that are bringing the right message or the right philosophy. So Dugin says in his book that Trumpism is more important than Trump himself. And um, so I was wondering, is that how we should also look at Dugin? Instead of trying to find any flaws or holes in his theories, um, should we... By himself. Yeah. Or, yeah, should we be like, you know, that Duganism, what the direction he's heading in, what he's trying to inspire people or questioning? Actually, so this is the thing that I've been listening. I've been trying to understand Dugin through other people who are studying his work better. And they say that Dugin isn't actually providing a solution He's saying that all of these things are wrong and he's leaving it to the people saying, what shall we bring in place of this? That's what That's he's saying. That's actually beautiful because yeah. what our problem is, we're not able to identify the problem, but we have right. the solution too. Right, mm. right, exactly, exactly. So in that sense, should we say that Duganism is more important than Dugin himself? Yeah, yeah. and anybody else, we're happy with anyone that's anti-liberal. Mm. It's right. not specific to a person. Even if it turns out that we, you know, there, there are things that we completely... We filter at all, anybody that's anti-liberalism, we take their ideas through the Quran, we mm -hmm. keep the jewels that are left and throw the rest out. And it could be Dugan, it could be X, it could be Y, it could be Z. It's fine. We have no problem. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Duganism in a sense that, you know, the, the, the idea of what he's trying to achieve. Ideology. But not the, yeah, not the person. Mm. I'm going to be honest. I avoided it in Sheikh Yerman Hussein's interview, uh, and I'm going to avoid it again here, but I want the viewers to know that the issue about um, the Uyghurs, China, um, actually, I'm just going to ask it right now. Yeah. So do you see any parallels between Uyghur propaganda and Black Lives Matters and Palestinian Lives Matters? Do you see similarities like that, you know, with... Um, uh, what is it? Uh, for example, here in the UK, you've got Insulate Britain, you've got Extinction Rebellion. Um, and yeah, so do you see any parallels, you know, with these? Do you... Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. So, uh, so as far as Black Lives Matter and all that, I see that different from what's the first. Uh, can you repeat the question? Because it was a few. Well, things. it's the Uyghur propaganda. Oh, the Uyghur. OK, so let me just deal with that. Uh, separately, because I see that separate from the right. second part of the question. Okay. The uh, Samuel Huntington, when he wrote the book Clash of Civilizations, he identified seven civilizations, Muslim and Chinese being two of them. 
And one of the things he says is we have to make sure the Muslim civilization has no alliance with the Christian civilization. Okay. So now with that in mind, we know that they'll be working to separate Muslims and Chinese. Okay. Second point, uh, the Muslims I know that have gone to China, that have lived in China, for like one brother, I know he works in petroleum. In fact, I plan to interview him at some point. Okay. He has gone to China, lived in China, knows China, been there multiple times, and does big business things with China. Okay. He is telling me that there's no special oppression against the Muslims. There are 10 Muslim tribes there. Or so majority of them are all fine and they have their independence to do what they want in terms of their religion and so on and so forth but the Uyghurs have been a problem and so they have been removed from where they are to another location right so it's specific to Uyghur number one number two Not Muslims Uyghur specific okay number two who brought up this issue where do you see the West. Uyghur Muslims where, BBC, you, where do you say Uyghur Muslims saying, please help us? Have you seen an advertisement of a Uyghur Muslim saying, we're being oppressed, can you please help us? It was BBC, the first time I saw something. BBC, CNN, so West, Western media. I think it media. was uh, the Pew Research or one of these uh, institutions here in the US think tanks that were the first ones to talk about how Muslims in China are being oppressed. So now... I have two major, I have three issues. Number one, I know a sincere Muslim brother who's telling me there are, it's, it's beyond what it looks like. Number one, this is a Muslim who's been there and I trust him more than CNN. Mm -hmm. Okay. For me, he's, anyone he's, more than he's, a, he's a direct, a, a, he's a direct sanad for me. Mm -hmm. He's a direct sanad for me than CNN. And okay. sorry, what is he for saying? Life? He's saying that there is no real actual oppression against Muslims. Okay. They have been moved from the Silk Road because mm -hmm. they were fighting the government and causing mm -hmm. problems. They were simply mm -hmm. removed from there to another place. About mm -hmm. 20,000, he said. Okay. Mm -hmm. So things have been done. Obviously, like I was saying, uh, uh, you know. The, so there is some but, truth in there. Obviously, there's got to be some truth. But not, 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 not Muslims, just Uyghur, just Uyghurs. Yeah, the, the whole tribe has been moved to another location. Okay. And uh, so there is that. And they've caught on that one little aspect that they've been moved to something bigger than it is. Yeah, we don't like oppression to Muslims wherever they are at any level, right? But in the hierarchy of priorities, uh, this is, uh, you can say, something that Christ the Muslim Chinese can deal with or can be dealt with diplomatically or in other ways, not the way that they're trying to make it into. So when a CNN or some think tank from the West tells me, oh, they're oppressing Muslims, that's, you know, very strange to me. You know? mm, absolutely. And that's the first I, alarm bell. That's the first okay. alarm bell. And the second <laughs> is that I don't see any Uyghur Muslim coming out and making YouTube video like those that have gone into the West. Yes, okay? yes. And uh, first hand I, accounts, first hand accounts. I think we have Uyghur Muslims here in Buffalo also, some of them. Okay. I don't see them saying and protesting against uh, the Chinese government. And some people may say, well, that's because, you know, they're oppressed. They don't want to be uh, hurt their families back home. Maybe that's part of it. But definitely what I know for sure, whatever China is doing or not doing, I, you know, other than this brother, I have very other few sources. But what I do know is that somebody is trying to exploit this for their own benefit. And somebody is trying to exploit this to create a disunity between Muslims and Chinese, whatever positive uh, unity there can be, which means what? Don't work with them, work with us. Mm. You know, that's what it means. Right. Yeah. So that agenda that you said that they have, uh, that you're not sure exactly what it is, um, I've been told. Well, I mean, I think Sheikh Imran mentioned it as well, the Belt and Road Initiative. They're trying to clear the way for the Belt and Road Initiative. Is that right, Sadi? Mm -hmm. It's all a bit it's all a bit fuzzy to me, but I know it's connected. Uh, I don't know, because based on what Sheikh just said, it could be that the Uyghurs are a troublesome threat to the Chinese government or 
maybe they have some historical baggage that mm -hmm. due to which either they, way what needs to be done mm -hmm. is we need to go to the Uyghur muslims and say hey do you have a problem right mm -hmm. absolutely absolutely okay so that's the quranic way right so you receive some information like for example okay palestine is a problem can i talk to palestinian muslims about the problem mm -hmm. yes kashmir is a problem can i talk to kashmir muslims that there's a problem yes okay so the Burma or any other place, I can talk to the Muslims and say, this is our problem. Okay, mm -hmm. let's do the same with the Uyghur Muslims. Let's leave the West out of this. Right. If there is an issue, let us know. Yes. Okay, if Absolutely. there is... And I, if hope, there, I if, hope viewers do take this and they direct us saying, hey, check this out. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we know the truth. We, we may not be right the first time we say yeah. something, but right. we yeah. should be open. Okay, if there is oppression... We mm -hmm. should be the first ones to stand up for oppression, but mm -hmm. we're not going to be of those people that are going to receive every information, especially mm -hmm. from the West and say, mm -hmm. okay, I guess China is bad because they're doing this to the Muslims. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So uh, the final question, um, are there any parallels to Islamic philosophy with the regards to the existence of the human being itself over any individualism, class struggle or nation? Should have mentioned the dashin. The, the... Yeah, so that's that's what it is basically. Okay, so I'll go through that. Um, so dashin. I'm not sure if it's dashin or dazien. I've heard a few people say daz dazain. So anyway, this is the philosophy that the Dugin um, uh, speaks of, and this is from Martin Heidegger's work, um, his existential philosophy. Basically, dazain or dajin is a German word that means being there or presence. And is often translated in the English word English with the word existence. So this is what Dugin's work is all derived from. It's all about Dajin or Dazain being based there. on the philosophy of existence. Existence itself. So this is my final question. Are there any parallels to Islamic philosophy with regards to existence of the human being itself over any individualism, <coughs> class struggle, or nation? What's interesting to me is that. This is, this is one of the areas where I think Iqbal has added to Dugan's thought. You know, how Dugan may have added the technology and medical and, and vaccine part that Iqbal didn't talk about. But Iqbal's biggest philosophy is falsify khudi. It's called falsify khudi, falsify of the self. Right. What does it mean to be the self? Right. This is his whole biggest uh, philosophy is on the idea of the self. Mm -hmm. The individual character building the self. Now, over here, I'll mention a few points, and I can't go into too much details about Iqbal's thought of the self, okay? Mm -hmm. But uh, number one, for there to be a self, there has to be the other, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. And there has to be the other to improve, like, in other words, everyone is in a state of struggle. The self is in a state of struggle. Dr. Islam used to call it jihad al baqa the jihad of survival, right? And so everything is trying to survive. And you, how do you know the self? How do you know there is a self, right? Mm -hmm. How do you know the self exists? Okay. So True experience. That and also by the other, right? Without the other, the self can, is very hard to define. So you have the mu'mineen and then you have the, the people that reject the truth. Right, like right. you can say, right. Kathleen. Right. I got you. You have to have the opposite. Yeah. Right. The opposite helps define the self. Mm. Okay, so what is happening with individualism is that there is no other, in a sense that there's no one opposing you. You're okay with everyone. Everyone's okay with everyone. There's no, there's no principle. There's no borders. You have no borders. Mm. Right. That, that is your no, belief. That is your truth. That is your truth. And everyone's truth. I'm is okay with you. Everyone. You're okay with me. And I'm I and you are you ending up being I'm not myself nor you are yourself. <laughs> okay. And, and, and let me just take this in a step further. Okay. We've all become like Jasad. In a sense, there's no ruh. Yeah. Right. So it's like, you know, from the Hadith perspective, when the Jasad baby was put on Suleiman Right, so we're all now being born like a jasad without a ruh, in a sense that you have now uh, this uh, whole world is just jasad, jasadi, ready to follow the jasad. Okay, and anyway, so uh, the the point I'm trying to say here about Iqbal 
So in order to know the self, you have to know the other, right? How does an organism know I'm self? It has to know the other to know the self. And the first phase of that is when the organism knows this is the mother and this is me. First, it thinks we're all one. It, the organism thinks me and the mother are one. And then it begins to have a identity. Okay, no, I'm different from the mother. Okay, so, so number one. Number two, that rather than having a, a self of no identity, which is what individualism is, right? That there's no hard principled, uh, you can't be a person of your word in that sense, meaning you have no real boundaries. Okay. Uh, now, Iqbal wants a self that is very well defined, like complete opposite of that, right? I live within these boundaries. I live within this Sharia. I live with Tawheed. I live with Risala. I live in the way of the messenger of the Prophet. These are things that define the self. They, and when the self is defined, and the more it's defined, and the more it's refined, and the more it can practically manifest those ideals, right? Because uh, so the more it can manifest those ideals, the more the self is true, okay? And the ending of this is what? So this is the beginning. The ending of Iqbal's philosophy is that make yourself so refined and so high that Allah asks your soul that what do you want? What do you mm. want? Wow. Right. And then in another place, he says, Iqbal in, in, in Jawab e Shikwa, he says, Ki Muhammad se wafa to ham tere He says, Allah is saying, if you love Prophet Muhammad, we are yours. Ye jahan cheese hai. What is this universe? It's nothing. We'll give you the blood and the ink by which you write your own destiny. And so wow. Iqbal is saying, the person who writes his destiny is the one who finds his inner self. Right. And to find your inner self, you need to have definition like borders and principles and ideas. Right. Without that, the self is nothing. Mm -hmm. Liberalism is basically not individualism in the real sense of the word, mm -hmm. in the Islamic sense of the word. Mm -hmm. it's, it is the implosion of the individual mm -hmm. where he's left hollow. Mm -hmm. according to Iqbal. Mm -hmm. You're just left hollow. You have no principles to stand on. Mm -hmm. And you're here one day and you're here one day and you're with this war one day and then the next year you're with the exact opposite end. We're with the trends of society. You have no self. The self is supposed to be well-defined and the self is supposed to look for elevation, right? Like Miraj of the prophet in a sense. And um, so when the self is elevated spiritually, you know, and Iqbal says about this uh, in another place about the self. He says, if you're a pigeon, it's your fault that you got killed. Why were you not an eagle that can fly high? Right. And so, uh, so in a sense, he compliments Dugan uh, that while Dugan is talking about against individualism, but Islam has this concept that Iqbal talks about, about the self about the refined self, or you can say futua in a sense, that where the individual is elevated by personality development, character development, which has a lot to do with the sunnahs of the prophet, the attitude of the prophet, the mercy of the prophet, the kindness of the prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So, he ref so that is a, that individual, Muhammad, right? That's an individual. He is an individual, you see. He is a self. Like he has a self. The it, others, they don't, they're dead. They don't even have a self. <clears throat> hmm. Sheikh, is that what, uh, when you were explaining elevation of the self, is that what, what Ibn Arabi was trying to teach uh, by unity of being? Like what was his philosophy? No, no, that's, that's different. Just, that's something that's different. different. That is Wahdatul Wujud. And Wahdat al Wujud in its correct form is this, which was then later on corrected by Mujadal al Sani. But I'll give you the version given by Shaulullah. Okay. Hmm. Which is that look, I see and Allah sees. But my seeing has no, is like being blind. Hmm. Right? In comparison, ratio, there's no ratio proportion for Allah. <coughs> I hmm. see and Allah sees. Hmm. Allah exists and I exist. Hmm. In comparison to Allah, nothing exists. Yes. Only Allah exists. 
Yes. So this is Wahdatul Wujud. Yani Allah is Wajibul Wujud. He is the necessary existence. And anything yes. else that exists is as if it doesn't even exist. Even though yes. it does exist, but it is as if it doesn't exist. This is Wahdatul Wujud. La, la ilaha illallah. La mahbuba illallah. There's no true love other than Allah. La matluba illallah. There's no true desire other than Allah. La, la wujuda illallah. There's no true existence other than Allah. So this, you know, this is part of that refining of the self that you get attached. Your, your uh, Iqbal called it the small I am uh, and Allah's big I am, you know, that your small I am becomes happy and in harmony with the big I am, meaning innani and Allah. Mm. So this is part of that refinement where a person knows his faqr, he knows his uh, dependency and contingency that I didn't have to exist, but Allah decided to exist, make me existence. Allah create, Allah create, Allah knew everything He could create. He didn't create everything He knew he could create. He only created some of the things He knew He could create. So we are just a possibility, and we are in the world of possibilities, and we're all contingent, and we're all dependent, and we're all temporary. And Allah is the only real existence. I feel like we could sit here and listen to so much more of this beautiful, poetic philosophy. Mashallah. <laughs> Sheikh, you should, uh, I think you should uh, make videos dedicated to Iqbal's poetry and because uh, some, many people cannot I mean, understand that level of Urdu. So you, you can perhaps uh, take a poem and explain. I did one, I think. I did one and uh, it was about La ilaha illallah. It was very beautiful. I have it online uh, about Iqbal and <coughs> he's, he, in that poem, you know, he talks about that you have a sword that's dull. It doesn't cut. Your la ilaha illallah is like a sword that doesn't cut through anything. Mm. It's not mm. breaking any idols. It's not cutting anything inside mm. you. It's a very dull sword. And then he says, look at the sword of Ibrahim, how he cut through all the idols of the time. And your, your sword is so dull, it can't cut through anything of its time. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. Ah, okay. So any, any final question, Brother Sadi, or any other <coughs> comments? No? Okay, Alhamdulillah. Jazakallah khair, Sheikh, for indulging us this much time. We appreciate it. And it was good to have you back after such a long time. Uh, good for all of us to be back, actually. And yeah, hopefully we can do something again similar soon, inshallah. Inshallah. Jazakallah khair. Okay. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Oh